The rubber game of the wild Subway Series in New York. Yankees at the Mets. John, Joe, Peter, and company. Thanks, Chris. It's just a short trip on the 7 train from Midtown Manhattan to Shea Stadium. And the most passionate baseball fans in the country are glad they've made it here. Tonight, it's Game 3 of the Subway Series. The battle for bragging rights on the world's biggest stage. No place like the Bronx, home of the house that Ruth built, New York, as it's meant to be. Only fresh mozzarella, only in the Bronx. Mine, Jello, oh, Mr. Y the Yankee fan. All about the streets and strutting your stuff with pride. Nothing like Queens, New York, for working class heroes, where you gotta believe is the battle cry. Uniting generations of Mets fans who boo the Yankees for the same reason their fans cheer them. So far this year, some problems for the pinstripers. Sheffield, Matsui, down and out. The big unit, a shadow of himself. But the spirit of the Bronx and their bombers can't be broken. The Mets' blend of youth and experience has them off to their best start in years. Sparking memories of when baseball's best resided on Roosevelt Avenue. It's a rivalry divided by boroughs. You must decide now. Are you for the Yankees or the Mets on Sunday Night Baseball? It's ESPN Sunday Night Baseball presented by Taco Bell and all roads and all subway lines it seems this weekend anyway lead to Shea Stadium in the borough of Queens for this subway series the New York Yankees and the New York Mets and it is in fact the rubber match of this three game series and Shea Stadium will be rocking tonight again for the third day in a row with Mets fans and Yankee fans co-mingling. Friday night, the Mets were down by four runs, finally tied the ball game, and against Mariano Rivera, David Wright with that base hit, drove in the winning run, and the Mets with a thrilling victory. Then yesterday, the Mets were leading 4 0 in the ninth inning. The Yankees came back to tie against Wagner, and then Andy Phillips got that base hit to drive in the winner in the 11th. Mariano Rivera took care of the rest, and the Yankees with a stunning comeback to even up the series. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, Peter Gammon, Sam Ryan. And Joe, this is the 10th year of interleague play. And here in New York, that means one thing, Subway Series. And it has not often been the case, but it is now that both ball clubs are going head-to-head -head as one of the best teams in their respective leagues. Well, John, New York, New York, this is the biggest stage for baseball in the world. And they've got some great stars, A-Rod for the Yankees and Derek Jeter. And then you take your chance and you look over to the Mets, and you have guys like David Wright, Jose Reyes, and of course the new addition to the Mets, Carlos Delgado. And I think this is important now, John, because a lot of Mets fans to think that they're as good as the Yankees, if not better. And I know Willie Randolph and Joe Torre have both taken their time and said this is just another series. But if you're a New Yorker, this is not just another series. Whether you root for the Yankees or the Mets, this is your season right now. All right, so here it is. Now, the New York Mets are all banged up right now. Aaron Small is making the start as an emergency replacement starter, and he's up against Tom Glavin, and Tom Glavin, who has been outstanding this year for the New York Mets as one of the top pitchers in the league, and Peter, he is once again one of the top pitchers in the league, and Peter will be talking about him throughout the ball game. So, we've got the Subway Series, the Yankees and the Mets. We've got, through the many years, New York versus New York, and that has meant drama and some of the game's greatest players. Willie Mays, when the Giants were the New York Giants. Mickey Mantle, the Yankee center fielder. And then more recently, David Wright, the hero here on Friday, the Mets' young rising star. And of course, Mariano Rivera, one of the greatest closers of all time. 
And now Tom Glavin, 281 wins, will make the start here tonight. And he's on his way back at Shea Stadium. And Derek Jeter will be coming up second for the Yankees tonight. And that will be happening very shortly. The Yankees batting order presented by Taco Bell. Johnny Damon leads off in center field. Then Derek Jeter, and he's having an outstanding early season at shortstop. Jason Giambi, he is in a, a, a funk right now, in a big slump. Alex Rodriguez at third base, batting cleanup. It'll be Robinson Cano at second base, moving up in the order because of all of the injuries. Bernie Williams back in there in left field, batting sixth. Melky Cabrera replacing the injured Gary Sheffield in right field. It'll be Kelly Stinnett back of the plate. Jorge Posada is banged up. And Aaron Small makes the start for the Yankees, batting ninth. All up against Tom Glavin, 281 wins and counting. He's won four in a row. For more on Tom Glavin, let's go to Peter Gammons. Well, Tom, a year ago, June, the next brass gathered and asked, is Tom Glavin done? The answer was no. His style, a way away fastball changeup was. So he made the adjustment. Fastballs are change up both sides of the plate. Curveballs, uh, cutters. Well, since last July 31st, he has the most wins in the best ERA in the National League. He's now only eight wins shy of being the fifth winningest pitcher in baseball history and 19 wins shy of 300 and a trip to Cooperstown. Well, and, and indeed, and for a guy who grew up in New England, his dad was a great fan of the old Boston Braves, whose star pitcher was Warren Spahn. And Tom Glavin talked about almost being taught the game by Warren Spahn through his dad. And he delivers ball one to Johnny Damon. We are underway here at Shea Stadium. And it's remarkable how close at age 40 Glavin's record is to where Spahn's was at the same age. And that is in there for a called strike. One ball, one strike to Johnny Damon. And you can hear already there's an electricity here at Shea, as there always is, it seems, Joe, for these Subway Series matchups. A ball and a strike. Broken back. Into center. That's a base hit. So Johnny Damon is aboard, and Jeter is coming up. Number two. Derek Jeter. Well, it looked like the ball was out toward the end. He didn't. I, I was wondering if he tried to jam him. He really didn't. That ball was over the plate, and he hit it toward the end of the bat, and he bloops it in the center field for a base hit. Now Johnny Damon's got a broken bone under the big toe on his right foot, so that is hampering him a little bit. But he has 10 steals this year, and Glavin moves him back to the bag. Carlos Delgado on the bag with him. We got a lot of wind blowing here tonight. There was some rain earlier this afternoon in New York, and uh, it has cleared out, but right now, a cool wind is blowing straight into the ballpark. 63 degrees, the game time temperature. One of the things that Glavin does to hold base runners is not necessarily have a great pickoff move to first base, but his delivery to the plate speeds up. He shortens his stride and goes to the plate. He does not have a great pickoff move. Here's Damon with his lead. And just missing on the inside around the knees. Tom Halley in the home plate up there. And already Tom Glavin looks a little perturbed not getting that call. Two and oh the count. Derek Jeter is a 360. Batting average against the Mets in regular season interleague games, the second highest batting average against the Mets among all the active big leaguers. That's going to be out of play. Two and one to Jeter. And Jeter, I mean, somehow it doesn't surprise you because these games are always big games. As you said at the outset of the telecast, Joe, it's New York. It's yeah. the big stage. And Jeter seems to be a guy who rises to the occasion. There's no doubt about it. I mean, in his career, he's had great, great postseason. At bats, great postseason contributions to the Yankees championship. Damon back to the bag. Delgado there with him. Well, if you are the Yankees and your lineup is struggling a little bit, you without Gary Sheffield, without Matsui, you may want to try something here with Glavin on the mound because you can hit and run. You know he's going to be around the plate. There goes Damon. Yeah. Del Duca's throw is offline, and Damon has his 11th steal. 
Well, it was a perfect hit and run situation. And with a guy like Glavin, you know he's going to be around the plate, which means that Jeter's going to have a chance to put the ball in play. So it's not that risky a play. And you see Damon gets a late start. The Duca's throw is offline, so Damon is in there easily as Matsui takes the ball on the shortstop side of the bag. And so now the pitch to Jeter into the hole at short. Reyes, this is a long throw. One hop. Got him. Nice play by Reyes. He did not have time to set himself because Jeter runs very well down the line. So he got rid of it quickly and he the hop was the main thing. He gave Delgado a very good hop at first base. Now watch he has to go deep in the hole. He's running away from first base. Gets rid of it quickly. Now here's bounces it and Delgado takes it half half a step. Jeter's foot is just above the bag when the ball goes in Delgado's glove. Wow. Good call by Mike Everett at first base. Outstanding call. And you don't see any argument from Jeter. This is Jason Giambi. And the chase that curveball didn't get it. Giambi in the month of May with only nine hits and 55 at bats, a 164 average. And this is coming off. He was having a great month of April. Looked like he was back to his MVP best. But now he's having a hard time getting any hits at all. Three men for the right side of second. That fastball in the dirt from Tom Glavin. One ball, one strike. And what that actually tells you is that if they're going to put three guys on that side, they're going to pitch him inside and throw him curveballs and changeups. Because if you pitch him away, he's going to slap the ball through the hole on the right on the left side. I and mean, if you put that many guys over there, especially with a runner at second base. Just missing on the inside. And you can see that. I mean, they're going to throw that was a change up inside. They're going to throw fastballs inside and curveballs. Try to keep him from using that left side of the infield. David Wright would be further towards shortstop. He would be over here a little bit more if it wasn't for the fact that Damon's at second base and he would steal third. Another change up. Two and two. Sometimes as a hitter you can tell how they're going to pitch you and what they're going to throw you just by the setup on defense and you can see there that's a change up down and in. Great change up from Glavin especially on a 2 1 count. And another off speed pitch down and away three and two Giambi only one hit in seven at bats in the series and four strikeouts. Well the one thing that Giambi does though John is he forces you to throw strikes. He doesn't go out of the strike zone too often. He will take a walk and with a rod on deck I think you have to go after him right now. Struck him out with a change up. I think as a hitter you have to just sit there and say well I know he's not going to throw me a fastball because they're playing me on the, to pull everything and there's a hole on the left side so you have to eliminate one pitch and I don't think Giambi did that because all the pitches were change ups and you can see it was way out in front of each one of them. But you know that he's not going to throw you a fastball at least you should know that by the way the defense is set up and he's out in front of that one as well as the other two that he missed. So two down Damon still at second here is Alex Rodriguez and this is a an oddity Joe it's hard to know exactly what to make of it but Alex Rodriguez has had no success at all when batting in the first inning of games which is I mean it's kind of weird. Well it is for a guy that hits 300 yes he's three for 26 and is at bats in the first inning a 115 batting average. in there for strike. He's hitting cleanup. Sometimes he doesn't get the bat in right. the first inning. But when he has, it's it's been a lost cause. He's got the lowest average of anybody in the major leagues in terms of his at bats in the first innings of games. And this is a big at bat, a chance to put his team ahead of one of the top pitchers in the National League. Fastball too low for Glavin. And you see this is the new Glavin pitching to Alex Rodriguez. He threw him a fastball on the inside corner. Normally with a runner in score position Glavin would never pitch a guy inside. He would just stay on the outside edge and try to get the guy to go for it. Damon. The runner in second ready to go in anything with two down and a curveball and that apparently around the outside three and one. 
I don't think he's as excited about pitching to a rod as you might think even though Robinson Cano is up next and he is a good hitter. Cano. On deck and he is a left handed hitter. Three and one. And he does walk. Alex Rodriguez and Cano will come up although Cano just a good all round hitter he's hitting yeah. 293 against left handed pitching and remember one thing Tom Glavin is not your typical left handed pitcher who bothers left handed hitters because he throws change ups he doesn't throw a lot of curveballs and so you know he actually is better most of the time against right handers simply because of those two pitches change up in the curveball but against the left handed hitter he does not really have anything to bother them any more than he does the right handed hitter. Two men on two men out. And that's ball one. John Glavin. Has thrown. 20 pitches in his first inning. And uh, 11 of the 20 have been out of the strike zone. Now the Yankees. Have just been chewing up the left handers this year. Got the call on that one. Around the outside at the knees. One ball, one strike. The Yankees are 11 and 2 in games started against them by left handed pitchers. 11 and 2. They're actually under 500 against the right handed starters. I would think that. One and one. With their full lineup in there, you know, when you have Sheffield in there. Uh, Bernie Williams who's helped when he's healthy even Matsui because he hits left handers well that they would eat up left handed pitching They're hitting as a team 296 against the lefties there's Gary Sheffield big hop at second base Matsui and the inning is over Damon led off the inning with a single stole second but he was stranded out there one hit two men left no score Subway Series action from Shea Stadium. The Mets will be coming up, and Sam Ryan is here with us. Let's go down to Sam. Well, John, Subway Series is huge for the fans, for the media, but what about the players who have been here since the beginning? Well, Derek Jeter said, you know, at first it was big because we hadn't done it before. We only played them three times, but now we play them six times a year, every year, so we treat them just like any other team, saying the Subway Series has lost its spark with the players. As for the Mets, Paul LaDuca is a newcomer to the Subway Series. He pretty much said just the opposite, saying this is what you go to spring training for. He said he ran into some rabid Met fans in a deli yesterday, and the excitement is a real boost for him and the team. And talking about boost, John and Joe, the attendance figures this weekend, the Mets have hosted their two largest crowds of the year this weekend. And that is something we've come to expect. They had over 56,000 people here both Friday night and Saturday afternoon. Now let's take a look at the Mets batting order as they get ready to face Aaron Small. The Mets starting lineup presented by Taco Bell. The exciting young shortstop Jose Reyes leads off. Then Paulo Duca in New York where he was born. The catcher Carlos Beltran hitting a lot of home runs in the month of May center field. Carlos Delgado the big slugger at first base 14 home runs already. David Wright the outstanding young third baseman hitting 314. Then Cliff Floyd and this guy's a big slugger but he is in a, a real slump right now. Xavier Nady the former Padre in right field. Kaz Matsui second base batting eight. And Tom Glavin is the pitcher batting. Now look at that batting average. He's a 400 hitter. He's Ted Williams. Well if you look at you know the, the entire staff that used to be with the Atlanta Braves they all could use the bat. They could bunt. They could do what they were supposed to do to help themselves win. So it wasn't any different. There you see Aaron Small. He was 10 and 0 last year but this is a new year and he's going to rely on his sinker and his change up and he's going to try to keep everything down in the strike zone but this is his first start so we don't know how long he's going to be able to go as far as the pitch count is concerned Sean Chacon was supposed to start this game but Chacon got a hit with a, a batted ball in the leg and he created a hematoma a deep bruise and he's hobbled and so Aaron Small is the emergency replacement starter for Chacon. Here's Reyes. Drops down a bunt but foul on the third base side. Every time whether he bunts or swings away if he hits the ball on the ground he's a threat to get a hit. Well and you know what he did there he tried to bunt the ball if you're leading off the ball game 
you try to make it perfect. If it's not, it's a foul ball. You do not give yourself up by just running it in fair territory, try to beat it out. He tried to make a perfect bunt down the third baseline. He didn't do it, so it's just one strike. Well, that's an interesting point. It's, yeah. You liked what he did there. Yeah. You just can't put it in play and hope you can beat it out. You know, try to make a perfect bunt, and even A Rod wouldn't have been able to get it if he makes a perfect bunt. Two strikes to catch him. And that's up and away. By the way, the Yankees are, are saying now that Sean Chacon missing the start tonight, that he may even go on the disabled list, such as the extent of the injury he suffered. They will probably make a decision about that tomorrow. Oh man, strike three call with the breaking ball. Well, let's take a look at Kazon, and we're going to show you something a little different. Watch the movement on this pitch. Big breaking curveball as John called it right there on the inside corner. I mean that's an overhand curveball. Beautifully thrown there by Small. And I think sometimes as a left hand hitter with a right hand hitter throwing you the curveball. It is tougher to handle the curveball inside. It's more difficult there than it is out over the plate. Because it kind of freezes you. You think it's going to break off the plate. Here's the Duke Loduca. He actually was born in Brooklyn but. When he was very, very young, his family moved out to the, the Phoenix area, to the Valley of the Sun. But as a kid, his dad was a great fan of the old Brooklyn Dodgers. And so Loduca, since they had no team in the Phoenix area when he grew up, he became a, uh, a Mets fan because they were the National League team from, from New York at that time. So he knew all about the Mets, their history. Now he is a Met. Change up. Got him chasing at one ball and two strikes. And that is very rare. Loduca rarely swings and misses. I think 5% of the time when he swung this year has he actually missed. He makes contact more often than any other hitter in the majors. Well, one of the reasons he makes contact, John, is he waits on the ball. He's going to right field a lot, so it's very difficult to fool him because he's fighting the ball off to right field a lot of times. Well, small fooled him. And a fastball off the outside. You fool hitters when they're moving out to, to attack the ball or going to get the ball. He waits for the ball to get to him and then he reacts. And that's why it's more difficult to fool him than it is other hitters. There's Smart Jeter. Pitch. And Jeter throws him out. Loduca gone. Two down. And here comes Carlos Beltran. He hit a home run in the first inning here Friday against Randy Johnson. In the twilight, that was a pretty good shot. The Beltran's 11th home run of the year, and he's hit most of them here in the month of May. Seven home runs during the month of May. Well, I really believe that Carlos Delgado is going to make a big difference in Beltran's season this year. Delgado is a calming influence on just about everybody on the team. Not just Beltron, but he is a common influence and he's a veteran. And he's got that great personality that helps to keep guys loose and relaxed. One and one the count. I mean he's a he's a natural leader just because of who right. he is. Right. He's got a, a real presence about him. But he also has that uh, sort of air of serenity about yeah, him as well. Exactly. Very calm. Two and one the count. Jeter near second. And that is the inning. Delgado stranded on deck. Three up and three down. Nice beginning for Aaron Small. Bernie Williams coming up for the Yankees when we return. No score. It's all New York. The Yankees and the Mets. And right now, the Mets are atop the National League's Eastern Division. They were off to a great start this year. The Yankees, as always, are right there, although second place behind the Red Sox at the start of the day. The Red Sox lost their game in Philadelphia today. Here's Bernie Williams. Bernie was not able to play yesterday with a, a muscle strain in his backside. And he also got hit in just above his left knee, and he said that's bothering him as well when I talked to him today. He said he was going to just go out there and see what he could do. That's into left center field. That's into the alleyway. Floyd cuts it off. Bernie digging for two. The throw not in time. A double for Bernie Williams. 
Bernie in second. Nobody out. Let's go to John Buchegras in the studio for a Sports Center 30 at 30 update. The Pistons beat the Cavs in Game 7 today. The Eastern Conference Final, Detroit Miami, begins Tuesday. Bob Rowe is close to coming out of surgery, and Pennsylvania surgeons are trying to save the thoroughbred's life after breaking his rear right ankle yesterday at the Preakness. No homers for Barry Bonds today. One hitter for Matt Cain. He returns home Monday to go head-to-head -to -head against Albert Pujols in San Francisco. All right, John, thanks. And there's ball one to Melky Cabrera, the switch hitting rookie outfielder, playing in place of the injured Gary Sheffield. And with the second inning in a row, the Yankees have a runner at second base with nobody out. Damon never got any further in the first inning. To the right side. Good job. He's thrown out by Matsui, but he moves Bernie Williams over to third base. Some uh, National League inside baseball yeah, right there. That's the way you play the game. And that's one of those things that doesn't show up on your batting average, but Joe Torre is very pleased with him. Let's take a look, and you can see him. He definitely is going the other way. Watch the movement of the pitch. There's a cutter coming inside, and he just fights it off. Excellent job by Cabrera. You see, look, he pulls his arms in and just fights it off. He goes the other way. And the Mets are going to play the infield in, John. They're not going to give away anything here. So very early to be playing the infield in, but yeah. I think perhaps Aaron Small's first inning had something to do with that. Yeah, and not only that, Aaron Small's on deck. They want to give up a run on a mediocre ground ball to the infield. They want to force you to have to hit the ball through the infield to get him home. Stinnett playing in place of the injured Jorge Posada. Posada had a sore upper back prevented him throwing to second base. He left the game Friday night in the, in the second inning because of that. Yesterday there was a great moment when you, you, you told the story about Bernie Williams getting hit by a pitch. Yeah. And he came in as a pinch hitter in the ninth inning. And Joe Torrey ran over to first base and he brought his little lineup car with him. He pulled it out of his back pocket. says, okay Bernie how you doing? Let me just say it's either you or Georgie meaning Jorge Posada. Mm -hmm. And of course they knew that Jorge couldn't play. Yeah. And Bernie just started laughing and said, yeah, 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 get out of here. And Joe went back to the dugout and Bernie stayed in. So they were, they're a little shorthanded and they are again tonight. They, they really only have three able-bodied players, non-pitchers on their bench for this game. There's Bernie over third base, exhorting Skinnett to bring him in here. You know, with all that stuff going on, what a victory yesterday for the Yankees down 4 0 in the ninth inning against Billy Wagner. That is strike three call, and Stanette is furious. Well, that's the new look Glavin there again. I told you, whenever he got in trouble before, everything was toward the outside corner, and he threw a couple of pitches out there, and this one comes on the inside part of the plate. Watch the movement. There's that cutter right there on the inside part of the plate, and it's in the acceptable range. I mean, maybe an inch or so off the plate, but it was very, very good pitch from Glavin, and that's what he's been doing. Here's Aaron Small now. The infield back in normal depth. He swings and misses of that changeup. Strike one. A windswept night here in Flushing Meadow. Wind blowing straight in from center. You see the kind of like a the, like a candlestick breeze. You see some hot dog wrappers being blown around. This time, did he swing? They asked the first base umpire, Mike Everett. He said, no. Come on. I don't think he said it that emphatically, John. <laughs> no, he was he was like offended. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Get serious. One ball, one strike. Small has had only three at bats in his entire big league career. He kind of looks like it right there on that swing. It could glad didn't throw that fast. He was about a half an hour late on that swing. But Anybody that swings a bat is dangerous, so you have to make sure you still make a good pitch on him, especially trying to keep the ball away from him. Struck him out with a changeup. Another threat for the Yankees, and again they come up empty. David Wright will be following Carlos Delgado when we come back. No score from New York. It's a subway series. The seven train means we're at Shea Stadium in Flushing Meadow, Queens, New York. It's the Yankees nothing, the Mets nothing. The original Subway Series was 
a term coined by the newspapers for World Series play between New York teams. The Yankees and the American League used to be the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And uh, those teams met 13 times in World Series play. 1921 through 1956 there was a time there from what 47 through 1957 there was always a New York team and usually more than one in the in the World Series and they had one subway series between the Yankees and Mets a subway World Series that was six years ago and the Mets are determined to get back to the World Series here this year that's one of the reasons they brought Carlos Delgado in facing Aaron Small that one is and hit a mile to right field. Foul. That's into the one, two, three, the fourth deck out of five here at Shea. One, two, count them, Joe. <laughs> what we got? I can't go past one, three. One, two, three, fourth deck. All right. So once you're past three decks, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Delgado up the fist. Man, that ball. Delgado has spectacular power. Well, the pitch was in. That's the reason he couldn't keep it fair. I know it's just a strike to you, but I I, I, I enjoy seeing the guy hit one like that. <laughs> fair or foul? It's impressive. Oh, it do the count. In the dirt with a changeup from Small. I asked Kelly Stinnett, I said, what what does uh, Small, what's he featuring these days? And he said, kitchen sink. <laughs> Which, uh, in other words, he'll throw him anything and everything, including the kitchen sink. Now Delgado. Now that's a candlestick move right there, right? From the old days of Candlestick <laughs> Park. You stop the game, grab that hot dog wrapper or whatever it is, and get it out of your way. It's a windswept night at Shea Stadium. One and two the count. Look out. High that was a breaking ball. Got his knees buckling. He lurched back out of the way. Two and two. Well, let's take a look at this pitch. And you see it's a slide piece. Or his version of a slider. Oh, man. Well, he went away this time. Nice pitching there to keep Delgado off balance. Third baseman, number five, David Rice. So Delgado gone. Pretty nasty looking pitch there from Aaron Small. Well, it was set up by the last slider inside that kept Delgado honest, kept him from leaning out over the plate, and then he went away with it. David Wright, he was Friday's hero for the Mets. And that's too high. One ball and no strikes to David Wright. And he's one of the, uh, the young Mets. I mean, they've got some veteran players, but guys like David Wright and Jose Reyes. That's what the Mets are really all about right now. A blend of outstanding young talent and the veterans. He hit that one right to Jason Giambi. There's Jose Reyes. You know, there was a big discussion last night because the Mets failed to turn a double play in the ninth inning and they could have won them the ball game had they turned a double play on Johnny Damon. Well, I want to say one thing. Reyes started that double play as well as you could start it. They didn't complete it. Damon was hustling down the line, so he beat it out. But I tell you what, Reyes made a great feed to Kaz Matsui at second base. He got rid of the ball very quickly, and I actually thought they were going to complete the double play, but they didn't get it done. One strike to Cliff Floyd. Two down, nobody on, no score. You know, I, I can see that play happening even as you talk about it. I think the difficult thing is remember Mas Matsui was a shortstop and he's converted over to second base yeah. now and basically I think he's still learning you know to make that pivot at second base. He used to be the, the feeder right. rather than the feedy on a play like that. One ball one strike. That one a change up to tail away and down two and one the count. You know because this is such a big series there's a lot of speculation going on about what happened yesterday in the ninth inning what happened during the game. There was just a lot of things that were replayed in people's minds that could have changed the outcome yesterday. It was and it was I mean here you think the big slugging Yankees with all their great all star talent but they were stealing bases right they were working walks hitting behind runners and 
Uh, and it all kind of centered around Billy Wagner, who just couldn't seem to throw a strike. Three and one the count at the knees with a fastball. Three and two. And Floyd thought it was in the too low. Yeah, but John, you're, if you're Cliff Floyd, you're struggling a little bit. You get a three and one count. You get a fastball. You're a good low fastball hitter. Even if it's an inch low, too low, you still hammer at it. Any swing can get you out of your slump. He had a home run yesterday, so you could, you know, back to back would help him. That ball in the deep right field. That ball is held up by the wind and missed by Melky Cabrera. Floyd to second, turns the corner, digging for third. He's going to slide with a triple. And I think he would have had his second homer in as many days, but that wind blowing straight in from right knocked it down. Well, I don't think there's any doubt, John, that ball would have gone out of here. I mean, it, it, the wind was, I could just see it fighting the wind all the time. If it would have been higher, he would have caught it. It was a line drive that it was still fighting the wind and he did a good job. It's a curveball. That's an off speed pitch right there. After the fastball three and one and you see Cabrera he couldn't get back there in time is the problem and he leaped at the wall and it actually hits about the middle of the wall but the wind did knock that pitch that ball down. So a triple for Floyd and here is Xavier Nady. Nady acquired from the Padres in the offseason hitting 276 and he's got nine home runs. He's third in the club in home runs. He's had some big home runs for this ball club. He's over the middle. Cano can he get it. There's the throw right there. Nice play. It made it look easy didn't it. And that saved a run. Beautifully done by young Robinson Cano. Floyd stranded at third still scoreless Damon then Jeter when we return. Sunday Night Baseball now in our 17th season on ESPN and welcome to the all New York brawl the Yankees and the Mets in the rubber match at Shea Stadium New York. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan Peter Gammons and Sam Ryan Here's Johnny Damon. He led off the game with a single stole second but got stranded there and a curveball from Tom Glavin in the dirt for a ball one ball one strike you know I'm heard Glavin tell me one time the, the story of. You know, his dad and Warren Spahn and how Spahn was his dad's favorite and all that kind of stuff. Damon to shortstop Reyes throws him out with that great arm and there is one away this time for the first time the Yankees do not get their leadoff man on. But he said you know as a kid his you know and he started having success with the Braves young the as a young player and, whatnot. and his dad said well you know uh, Spahnie. Uh, Glavin won 20 games. His Spotty won 20 games like eight or nine times. You know, it's great you did it the one time, but Spotty won 363 games. Glavin ended up with 242 wins and two Cy Young awards as a member of the Braves. But he's closing in on 300 wins, and it was remarkable. We we looked up Joe just how he compared to Spawn. When Spawn was the same age as Glavin is right now, and their numbers are almost identical. Yeah, but Spawn pitched so well after that. Yeah, I mean, Spawn won 75 games yeah. after he turned 40. Exactly. I mean, he was unbelievable. Curveball hangs up and away. One ball and one strike. But this is really an interesting thing, and the Elias Bureau looked this up for us. As uh, Derek Jeter stands in with a count of one ball, one strike. Jeter thrown out by Reyes on a beautiful play in the first inning. And that change up is too low from Glavin. Two and one to Jeter. And look at that. Warren Spahn at the same age as Glavin is tonight. Had 14 more wins than Glavin and three more losses. I mean that's remarkable how close that is. Spahn ended up being the winningest left hander in the history. Won 363 games. That's a base hit to left field. Well they got the change up up a little bit to Jeter. So the single for Jeter. Now the power is coming up. And even with Sheffield gone, Matsui gone, you got Giambi, Arod, Cano. I mean, there's still a lot of lightning in this Yankee lineup. But Matsui, 100 RBIs in three straight seasons for the Yankees, and he may be lost for the year. Sheffield, who's also had three consecutive seasons with 100 RBIs, Sheffield took batting practice tonight, and the Yankees are pretty excited about that. Giambi, base hit. 
Jeter over to second. He'll stop there as Nady comes up with it. Well, that was amazing. You know, we saw Glavin pitch Giambi with change ups and change ups and curveballs. So, what does he do? He starts him off with a fastball. And what does he do? Jumps right on it. Smart hitting there by Giambi because he had thrown him all change ups and he goes inside with a fastball. Not a lot of movement and he rips it to right field for a base hit. He had not touched the changeup, so Gladden was trying to steal a strike with a fastball. Didn't work. Okay, here is A-Rod. Two men on, one man out. Wow, on that inside with a fastball. He blew it right by him. Rodriguez. And the numbers are not very good for A-Rod. I mean, they're not bad for just about anybody else. He's on a pace for 120 RBIs or so and 35, 36 home runs. But A Rod has set the bar pretty high. The MVP in the league last year. So far, hitting only 265, actually a little bit lower than his season's average. In these clutch situations, runners in scoring position. He's got one right now. Jeter at second base. No score. They have four hits against Glavin already. And a soaring pop up. Shadow left. Remember, they've got a lot of wind tonight. Floyd is coming. And he's got it. So two now. We're talking about Gary Sheffield. He took BP tonight. And Peter Gammons was down there when he did. Peter? Second baseman. Well, well, Tyler, I talked to Gary at some length, and he said, you know, he finally decided to have another cortisone shot this weekend. He felt a lot better. In fact, when Don Mattingly came out, I went, oh, no, what is he doing? He said, look at those swings. But he really swung the bat well tonight. He's going to probably go out on a rehab assignment tomorrow and might be back next weekend. Well, I saw him take his last few swings, and he hit a couple balls well into the seats in left field. He started off very slowly, just getting loose with the bat. But by the time he was finishing his swing, he was swinging hard. Yeah, he put on a show eventually. And uh, Robinson Cano hits into the force play. Kazmatsui to Reyes for the force out on Giambi. Two hits, two left. No score. Kazmatsui will be coming up. Then Glavin when we come back. Here is Kazmatsui leading off of the Mets. Back to the second that a slider is in there for a called strike from Aaron Small. No score. Matsui. Then the pitcher Tom Glavin. The leadoff man Jose Reyes coming up with the match here in the third. That's foul. It's really been a all Yankees up to now. They've had just one threat after another. I mean, Glavin has been pitching under duress the entire way since the very first batter of the game. He's seemingly forever been in the stretch in these first three innings. But the Yankees, despite four hits and a walk, are 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position already. Fastball up and away. One ball, two strikes, and it is scoreless. Only one hit for the Mets so far, and two out triple by Floyd in the second. A ball and two strikes. And that breaking ball popped up. There is Alex Rodriguez, and there is one away. Now, the Yankees in the midst of a some real high profile games right now. They leave Shea Stadium right after the game the pitcher, and head up to Boston. And on I, right here on ESPN, it'll be the Yankees and the Red Sox from Fenway Park, 7 o'clock Eastern. It will be available in high definition on ESPN HD. Dave O'Brien and Rick Sutcliffe will be there to bring it all to you from Fenway. The Red Sox were in Philadelphia today, they were defeated by the Phillies 10 to 5. Is Tom Glavin. Glavin is hitting 462 so far this year. And that little breaking ball misses for ball one. Glavin has six hits and 13 at bats. And two runs batted in. That is a called strike. Spawn, by the way, Joe, is, as you recall, an excellent hitter, wasn't he? Yeah. Tomorrow night, Chin Ming Long for the Yankees against Kurt Schilling. Jarrett Wright, Tim Wakefield on Tuesday. Glavin got a little dribbling and small to Giambi. Glavin is retired. Two down here in the Mets third inning. And then Randy Johnson and Matt Clement Wednesday. That also will be carried on ESPN and ESPN HD at 7 o'clock Eastern Time for Pacific. So the Yankees will get chilling, but they do miss Josh Beckett, who is 6 and 1 so far this year. 
Beckett got a win over the Phillies this weekend. He got a win and he hit a home run. Here's Reyes. Two down. And the curve misses. One ball, no strikes. Here's Randy Johnson. Broken back. Jeter. Got rid of it in a hurry. Nicely done. Well, Aaron Small is making it look easy so far. No score. He's allowed only one base runner in three innings. We'll be back. Miller with Joe Morgan, Peter Gammon, Sam Ryan from Shea. And here is Bernie Williams, the veteran of many of these Subway Series, both in the regular season and the World Series as a Yankee versus the Mets. The ball and the throwback from Loduca got away from Gladden. Bernie hit a double leading off the second inning. One of the uh, opportunities the Yankees have had. They've had chances to score in each of the first three innings. But have not yet. Tom Glavin with a 1 0 count. And that is a called strike. Again, we've seen Tom Glavin throw more pitches inside here in the first couple of innings than you usually see him throw an entire ball game, especially for strikes. He may throw them off the plate inside, but he's throwing strikes now inside corner. He will throw back. a lot of pitches like that. Goes back in there again off the corner. Two balls and a strike. Welcome to Sunday Night Baseball. We're at Shea Stadium. The New York Mets atop the National League's Eastern Division by three games at the start of the day. And the Yankees, who were a game and a half back of the Red Sox when the day began, in the American League East, 56,000 plus for the third day in a row, jamming Shea Stadium for the all New York matchup. As was the case all weekend in Chicago. They had the all Chicago going. The White Sox and the Cubs over the weekend. And some bad blood there. That pop up. Everybody going for it. the wind is blowing around. Nobody gets it. Heading for second base is Bernie. Noduka one hop throw too late. Well, you know what? That's great hustle by Bernie Williams. And we all we mentioned he's got a bad draw. He's got a bad a leg pull in his buttocks. And he also has a knee injury but you talked about the win but no one challenged this ball first of all watch the ball go up no one challenged it not even Glavin but Glavin should be over there helping to decide who catches the ball and there's Bernie going to second base I mean that's an infield pop up that he turns into a double so it tells you that he was running and you see him running all out and he ends up at second base with a double and here is Melky Cabrera so Bernie is two for two, two doubles, and that was just out and out hustle, Joe. That was great to see. But I, Glavin was on the mound. He didn't go over. Delgado didn't challenge it. Laduca went down the line, but I think it should have been caught by someone on the infield. Or at least challenged by someone on the infield. Now Melky Cabrera in this similar spot in the second, well the same spot really, runner at second, nobody out. He got the ground ball to the right side to move Bernie Williams over to third base. Sheffield out of action. Took BP tonight though. An encouraging sign. Now Glavin holds Bernie and throws out Cabrera. He got him lunging at that changeup. Not this time for Melky Cabrera. He's not able to move him up. You know, you showed the Gary Kingston, Sheffield there. Kingston. Let me tell you something. Gary Sheffield is still the most important hitter in this Yankee lineup. I know A-Rod won the MVP, but remember two years ago it was Sheffield who was up for the MVP for the Yankees. He is the most important hitter in that lineup. He allows everyone around him to do what they do. And he's the most feared hitter by the other teams as well. Here's Stinnett to count his own one. But with both Sheffield out and Kazmatsui, the left fielder out, the, the Yankees, or I say Hideo, Kazma, yeah. uh, Hideki Matsui, yeah. the Yankees Matsui, out. Uh, there's a lot of talk that they're looking for an outfield, and Peter Gammons uh, has uh, sort of gotten involved in the, the grapevine as, as to what is blowing in the wind there, Peter. 
Well, John, you know, it, what jo Joe is completely right. It's all about getting Gary Sheffield back in the lineup. The, the way they, the way Brian Cashfield look at he's trying to make a trade. There's a lot of talk about Jay Payton. They've talked about him more than anyone else. But he's not going to give up his best prospect, Philip Hughes, a double-A pitcher. And anyway, he says, look, when Sheffield comes back, maybe Terrence Long is in the minor league, comes up and helps. They've got Richard Hidalgo. They've got Uribe El Durazo. They've got Carlos Pena. He will not panic as long as he knows that Gary Sheffield will be back within 10 days. Well, what he also said, Peter, was that he said everybody expects the Yankees to do something. He said other teams ride it out when they have injuries. They bring some up their farm system to work through it. He said everybody expects the Yankees to go out and overspend for a player to replace somebody. He says we're just going to have to ride it out until we get Sheffield back. And if they get Sheffield back, I guarantee it'll make a big difference in this lineup. Well, I agree. And I think yesterday's win just absolutely uh, was a bell. A solidified exactly what he was talking about. Well, there's ball four to Stinnett that puts two men on and brings up Aaron Small, the Yankee pitcher. Runners at first and second, only one out. We're talking about Sheffield, who surprised a lot of people taking batting practice today, and this was the scene earlier. Sheffield was well. You can see he starts off cage. slowly, John, just swinging easy, and he does have some pain at the beginning. But by the end of his batting practice. I mean, he was swinging the bat well. He told me, he told Joe Torre, he told everybody, hey, I feel great. And he actually was swinging the bat very well at the end of his batting practice session. Yeah, he hit. And Joe Torre couldn't see it because he was surrounded by reporters in the dugout. As we said, this is such a big series, and the Yankee manager does not get a chance to go on the field as often as other managers do and watch his players. Small showing bunt. He takes ball one from Tom Glavin. Well, I think this is the right play. We saw Small try to swing the bat the last time up and with no with very little success and even coming close to making contact. So what you try to do is move two runners in the scoring position and give Johnny Damon a chance to drive them in. Bernie Williams at second. Kelly Stanette at first. They're pulled in on both sides, expecting the bunt. And that is well yeah. done. David Wright's play is the first base and the runners move up. Well, the one thing you always want to do in this situation is force the third baseman to feel the ball because obviously that leaves third base unoccupied and they Center can't fielder, get the runner Jimmy from second base. But the, the key to bunting is getting the barrel of the bat out front. You have to get the barrel of the bat out front. So he does have it out there and then you just kind of play catch. See the barrel is out front. Well he kind of punches at it but then you just play catch. Put the barrel out there and just catch the ball on the bat. And it becomes easy to bunt. And bunting obviously is a lost art. Here's Johnny Damon. Well, apparently Aaron Small is the guy who found it. Yeah. Because a lot of guys will punch at the ball or, you know, push at it. You just put the barrel out front and just catch it. That's all you have to do. Runners at second and third. Johnny Damon is singled and grounded out. Two down. And that got him. The bases are loaded. And here comes Derek Jeter. And Jeter has hit the ball hard twice. He was robbed of a base hit in the first inning by Jose Reyes, and then he lined the single to left field. And when I watched Jeter's approach to Glavin, Glavin didn't look like he had any pitch that he was bothering him with. He waited on the changeups. He wasn't phased by the fastball. He just seems like he's right on everything that Glavin's throwing. Jeter has only one grand slam in his career, but a 340 batting average in these bases loaded situations in his career. And if you're glad you just can't continue to get in trouble and figure you're going to get out every inning. On the inside corner strike one with a fastball. Excellent pitch because again the changeup wasn't bothering Jeter as it has been with some of the other hitters. The Yankees have not had a hit yet in this kind of a situation where a, a base hit could knock in some runs. This is the third inning out of four. Where they've had multiple base runners. And it is the fourth inning out of four where they have had scoring threats where one base hit to the outfield could knock in a run or well, more. Well, that's what that means percentages are in their favor. That's the point. And Derek Jeter's in their favor. He's the right guy at the right time in this situation. So Tom Glavin continuing from the stretch. High stress situation. Jeter in the hole and under both Wright and Reyes. Bernie Williams scores. Stinnett scores. Damon around the third. And the Yankees have gone ahead 2-0 on one that got away from David Wright. 
Well, it, it was a tough play, but the play could have been made. But it was a difficult play for David Wright. It was not an easy play. This ball is hit sharply. And he gets the in between hop. And he wasn't able to handle it. What you want is a fielder. You want to get the ball just when it's coming off the ground or on the big hop. That's called the in between hop. And it, I was surprised that it got past Reyes as well. When it got past Reyes, that allowed the second run to score. Stinnett. Now Giambi to try and drive in more. Outside for ball one. Giambi has struck out and singled to right. Two nothing. They have given. Derek Jeter credit for a base hit and two runs batted in. Although the play looked easier in slow motion than in the speed at which it actually happened. Yeah, I mean the problem was it was the in-between hop. That's what hurt him. So Jeter with his 31st and 32nd runs batted in. But I'm pretty sure all Mets fans feel that play should have been made and the inning over. Jambi well, pulls it foul on the count two and one now. Watch. The ball is hit sharply, so instead of him being able to come and get it, he goes sideways. And because it was hit so sharply, he didn't have time to come forward. And when you come forward, you can get it on the between in, uh, the short hop. You can see he went sideways because it was hit so sharply, he didn't have time to come forward and get it. So he got the tough hop, and he wasn't able to make the play. And Wright has had some defensive problems at times this year. He's Committed seven errors in a quarter of a season. Inside with the off speed pitch. Three and one. Alex Rodriguez is on deck. The American League MVP last year. Three and one to Giambi. Runners at first and third. And he walks. He has walked more often than any other. Hitter in the American League. That's the 43rd time that he's walked this year. And you're right back to the same situation. Bases loaded with a tough hitter up there. Third base. And Tom Glavin, it's the fourth inning. And he has thrown 73 pitches as he meets at the mound with Paul Loduca. There's his manager, Willie Randolph. And the, the Mets bullpen has gone over and beyond the call of duty in terms of service in this. Series. The, the Mets bullpen pitched six innings and was the reason they came back to win that game Friday, or at least that they had a chance to come back and win it. John, Alex Rodriguez just missed hitting that ball out last time, so you got to stay away from that zone. That's a called strike. A Rod has walked and popped out to shallow left. And that's ball he hit the left field. I mean, he just barely missed it. He got underneath it. I mean, and if Alex hits it out to left center, it'll go out. Remember this all started on a, a pop up that landed 45 feet away from home plate. Alex drives that one hard but with topspin and into the glove of Cliff Floyd who had while he was backpedaling had to jump up a little bit for it. But the Yankees finally break through. Loduca Beltran Delgado coming up. It's time to find the number one fan in baseball. Visit Chevy.com slash baseball and tell us why it should be you. The grand prize, a trip for two to the 2006 All-Star Game. Baseball's number one fan contest presented by Chevrolet. Chevy, an American revolution. ESP at Sunday Night Baseball. It's the Subway Series. New York versus New York. The Yankees have broken through to take the lead in this ball game now. As we get the panoramic look at the crowded Shea Mets fans Yankee fans both in attendance and right now the Yankee fans a little more satisfied with this one although the team that has had to come from behind in this series is the team that has won yeah, the Mets were down by four Friday and they won the Yankees were down by four in the ninth inning yesterday and won as Loduca hits it foul but if you're like Glavin continuing to get into jams it only takes one bad play one base hit you know to, to break it open and the long the more times you give the Yankees to do that the more times you're going to get a you know something to happen that's why I said you're 0 for 9 with runners in scoring position that meant things were in their favor. Loduca chases one and misses that's two times he has swung and missed against Aaron Small tonight and both times was on a changer. Well 
I know you spent some time with David Wright before the game. I saw you over there yeah, conversing he's... with him. And uh, and I know you talked to him about Carlos Delgado and his presence. That changed up. Only got a piece of that one bouncing at foul. But he's great to talk to. He's got a great understanding of the game. And he understand his role, you know, here in New York and being on the match, et cetera. I mean, I, I think, you know, he's going to be one of the young superstars that's going to be the next maybe big superstar here in New York. I mean, he's got great numbers already at age 23, and yet it's still a learning process for him. Yeah. I mean, for Willie Randolph, he looks at David Wright and Jose Reyes. Is, he's trying to, to win a pennant and all that and go to the series, but he's also trying to de help develop these young players and help them realize their full potential which is great. They walked Delgado intentionally to get him to him in the ninth inning on Friday and right then got the winning hit and Randolph said when they walked Delgado he said he was glad because he wanted to see Wright put into practice what they'd been talking about and that's a base hit for Paul Oduka a real battle there. Beltran coming up now Delgado out on deck. And as I said, Joe Morgan chatted with David Wright before the game. I was noticing in, in batting practice how you guys have a good time hitting. I think that's part of this game that makes it fun. And Delgado, he was always on you. <laughs> he is. He's, uh, he's been great to me, though. Yeah. I mean, if, if you talk about production in his career, and he's, he's one of the best as far as run producers. Uh, you know, I've tried to pick his brain as much as I can. He gives me a hard time, but, you know, I, I think I'd be uh, a little worried if the veteran guys didn't <laughs> give me a hard time because that's when you know they like you, and that's when they know that they're going to help you out. Here's Beltran. And that is off the outside ball one. And he mentioned a lot of guys that you know he's gotten help from, especially veteran players. And he said, you know, when Piazza was here, I mean, the veteran guys seem to, and all veteran players like young players who are willing to listen and want to learn. And he definitely wants to learn and get better. Delgado on deck. Beltran grounded the short his first time. And the backdoor slider for a strike over the outside. One ball, one strike. The interesting thing about Beltron is we'll take a look at K zone and you can see the movement on that pitch. And surely it, enough, it was a strike on the outside. Well, trying 11 home runs this year. And he's hit seven of them so far in the first three weeks of May. Uh, the, the Beltron that we're looking at now has a chance to go on a tear like he did, you know, with Houston. Not maybe not that great a tear, but he's a guy now that I think can carry this ball club through stretches at a time. And I think the real reason for that is Delgado, who has really helped him to understand his role here in New York. Oh, did he swing? No. Third base umpire, Larry Young, the crew chief, ruling in favor of Beltran, so it is two and one. Well, he had 38 home runs two years ago, uh, the Astros, but which is good, but I mean, it's not. Not earth shattering, not in today's game, but he was a great center fielder defensively. He stole 40 bases. He brought, and then he had that incredible stretch in the postseason that year. That's a base hit just out of the reach of Jeter. And now they have set it up nicely for their big home run slugger, the RBI man, Delgado, coming up. Yeah, good job by Beltron. He did not try to pull that ball. You can see Stanette set up outside. You see the ball moving away from him. And you can see he doesn't try to pull it. He goes the other way with it. Just that's a that's great swing right there. Jeter still almost made the play, but it was hit so sharply he didn't have time to get over there. Now Delgado. He has been caught out on strikes in his only at bat. Two men on, nobody out. The Mets trying to come right back after the Yankees put two on the board in the first half of the inning. Two nothing Yankees last of the fourth. That ball against the wind. Way back there. Cabrera. It's gone. A three run homer for Delgado. Since the Mets have acquired Delgado, I felt like they could win the East because this guy is a big-time player. 
And he's a big time leader and I think that's what they needed. They want him to come out and take a bow. Everybody's still standing at Shea. Damon Wright the hitter. Strike on the outside of the knees. I remember they tried to get Delgado two years ago before he went to the Marlins. But it didn't work out. So Omar Minaya continued to work and he got him here this year. Now some guys like Beltran last year for instance. Yeah. Coming to New York is difficult. Yeah. And then there's Delgado. But Delgado is a guy that had had a proven track record. Big time player. Deep to left field. You can forget about it. Off into the night. Over everything. Out into the streets of New York. What a shot. Four to two the Mets lead. John you try to tell these fans this is just another series. This is the big leagues right here. This is what baseball is all about having a game like this in a setting like this. And if you're a player you'd love to be playing in this type of atmosphere. Delgado and Wright. With. Booming shots one right after the other and Wright's over the wall and over the bullpen. Now Floyd who also has great power who lost a homer to the wind his first time he had to settle for a triple one thing to remember his ball was a change up off speed pitch so he had to supply the power Delgado's and Wright's were fastballs, so when the big guys hit the fastballs they don't come back. Let's take a look this is a high fastball to Delgado. High fastball right in the middle of the plate I mean when he hits a fastball it's not coming back David Wright same pitch high fastball. And it's not coming back. Floyd had the bad luck to get a change up and, and he had to supply all the power himself. But when the big guys hit it, the wind does not affect them. The third time this year that the Mets have had back to back home runs. Two and one the count. Floyd. Another curveball though. Now the center fielder Damon started back on that one and then it came hustling in into left center. And that is the first out of the inning after four runs score. Small finally gets it out. You know it's interesting John we talked about this at the beginning we said how long could Aaron Small go because he hasn't been you know a starter. Well you know he's in the fourth inning now. That's a little bit of a little farther than he's accustomed to going so far this year. Yeah. I mean although he did pitch four innings. His last time out, but he hasn't been a starter like Small he was last year. He's been in five games and pitched a total of ten and a third innings. Right. So a little different. He run out of gas very quickly at times, and there you see at 57 total pitches. And that's not making excuses; it's just the fact that he hasn't pitched, and you can't, you cannot handle these good hitters if you have less than your best stuff. The estimate on the home run by David Wright is that it went 445 feet. Well the wind didn't actually hurt Wright's but it was fighting Delgado's well it didn't do it. It lost the fight very quickly actually. And the wind is not as strong no, as it, it was yeah, before. That's a good point. One and two to Xavier Nady. That's foul. Nady says that the proper way to say his name is Xavier. But. And it's a name that goes way back in the history of his family. A couple of hundred years. But he said he thought because his nickname was the X-Man. So he thought I'm going to be different. I'm going to say Xavier. And that's the way he's asked for it to be said. And that's a base hit for Nady. That is the fifth hit of the inning for the Mets. Well we talked about Delgado being the key to this ball club and there's a fastball that he just hammers deep to right field. At the back of the bullpen and then David Wright gets a fastball the wind is not fighting David Wright's he gets another fastball. And you can see left fielder Williams doesn't even really chase that one he knows that was gone from the time it left the bat. Did he get up? 
Yeah. And Delgado reacting when right it is. And, and again, you know, Delgado is a winner, John. I mean, he's a he's a winning player. He plays the game the way you're supposed to play it. He plays it to win. And I think that's do you see that smile of his? We talked about it earlier. I think he keeps everybody else calm. I mean that I think of all the additions that Omar Minaya has made here that's the key addition getting Carlos Delgado. Here is Cosma One out runner at first and back to the back. Here's Nady. This could be two. Cano steps in the bag one and doubles him up. But the Mets get four. After four, four to two, the Mets lead the Yankees. The NBA Finals start June 8th on ABC. I always said I was going to be playing professional baseball. Yeah, that's all I ever talked about. The thing that means most to me is I want to be remembered as a Yankee. You either love us or hate us. I mean, I enjoy playing at home in front of the greatest fans in the world. And I also enjoy going on the road with people booing us and hating us. The bottom line is when you compete, you want to win. I live for this. Catch Major League Baseball all season long on ESPN. Don't miss it. Sunday Night Baseball from Shea Stadium presented by Taco Bell. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan along with Peter Gammons and Sam Ryan. The New York Mets came roaring back after the Yankees scratched and clawed their way to two runs against Glavin with a uh, display of power. A three run homer by Delgado and then David Wright with a tape measure shot right behind it. And just like that four on the board for the other team from New York which that's sort of the status to which they've been relegated these last several years because the Yankees have not only dominated the uh, American League East they've just dominated New York. Well as I said earlier there are a lot of Mets fans who think that the Mets are as good if not better than the Yankees considering the pitching and everything else. They do not have as good a starting lineup when the Yankees are healthy but the pitching I think can match up and maybe is a little better. Although no one is as good as Mariano Rivera on either side. On either side, or maybe yeah. any side Any anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Sheffield could go out on a rehab assignment as early as tomorrow. Two and two, the count. Now to Robinson Cano, the Yankees outstanding young second baseman, 23 years old. He emerged last year, and the Yankees were undergoing trials and tribulations. There is Matsui, and Cano is 0 for 3. One out of the fifth inning. Let's go to John Butchergrass in the studio with the Sports Center 30 at 30 update. Eastern Conference Final begins Tuesday, John. Heat against the Pistons. Detroit beat Cleveland in game seven today. So far, so good for Barbaro. Out of surgery. After six hours of surgery, he's resting in intensive care. No homers for Barry Bonds. He'll try again for 7:15 tomorrow against Albert Pujols. Details on Sports Center after the game or on your ESPN mobile phone right now. All right, thanks, John. And here is Bernie Williams. Bernie started the two run fourth inning rally with a pop up, a wind blown pop up that nobody caught. It dropped to the infield about 45 feet from home plate, and he legged it into a double. And that was the beginning of a two run rally. So it also kind of tells you the problems they're having with Tom Glavin. They, they've had plenty of base runners against Glavin, but they've not been able to do much with him. They finally turned in that pop up for a double. A walk, a hit batsman, and then the ground ball by Jeter that on another night might have been handled by David Wright. It was scored as a single for Jeter, but I'm, I'm sure Wright, if you ask him afterward, will say, hey, I should have come up with that one. Anyway, that's how they got their two runs. Yeah, but again, if you keep putting the threats out there, you're going to eventually cash in. And that's exactly what happened because he was just struggling too much, putting too many runners on base. The curveball in the dirt to Bernie. John, I was I was watching John Butchergrass talk about the Pistons today, and I was watching the game, and Joey Crawford was one of the one of the uh, officials. His brother Jerry Crawford is an official 
major league umpire and his dad Shad Crawford was a major league umpire as well. So that's we're always talking about fans. We're talking about officiating families now too. And there you see Patrick Ewing of the Knicks. He is now um, a coach with the Houston Rockets. He works with Yao Ming. I've seen him work with Yao when I've been in Houston there. And back to the, the Crawford family. Jerry Crawford has 30 years in the major league as an umpire. Joey Crawford has 29 years as an NBA official. And his their father, Shag, was one of the all-time great major league umpires. One of the all-time great umpire names. Yeah. <laughs> Shag Crawford. Shag Crawford. <laughs> Three and two. And that's in the day. Shag Crawford, Al Barlick, Augie Donatelli. Yeah. Jocko Conlon. Yeah. One out. Bernie Williams to first base on the walk by Glavin. Right Let's get out to Sam Ryan around. for more on Tom Glavin. Sam? Well, John, Tom Glavin used a golf analogy to best describe his altered pitching style, saying it was like going out there with two clubs. Now he's going out there with a full set. He can pick which one he needs. He said, my foundation, what made me successful over the years, is still my foundation. It's still what I bring to the mound. But if something isn't working, there are other things I can do. And we've seen an example of that today, Sam, because I talked about Glavin in the past would always pitch outside, outside. That's using that one club you're talking about. Now he goes inside, so he's added a couple of more clubs and a couple of more pitches by moving the ball inside to his repertoire. So he's got a full set of golf clubs so and a full set of out pitches. For a year and a half or so there, Joe, he was not playing well enough to make the cut right <laughs> but now he's back there he's and he, back. he looks like he'll be invited to the next Masters <laughs> all right all right we could go on with this golf thing for a long time going to the count I mean Tom Glavin and Pedro Martinez are the leaders of this Mets rotation which is it's itself banged up right now they got yeah. two of the five starters on the disabled list you see when Martinez and Glavin have pitched it's been a whole different game than when anybody else has been the starting pitcher for the Mets. Pedro was victimized yesterday he should have won a sixth game and uh, 99 times out of 100 would have but yesterday was that one time and Bill Wagner just didn't have it yesterday couldn't throw a strike. There was a lot of talk about well why did Willie bring him in with a four run lead. The middle. There is Kazmatsui to Reyes to first Man. double play. Melky Cabrera hits into a pair and extraordinarily turned at second by Reyes. In 60 seconds, we will visit with Joe Torrey from the Yankee dugout. Four to two Mets. We'll be back with Joe Torrey in 60. Sunday Night Baseball from New York. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, Peter Gammon, Sam Ryan. And we are very pleased to be joined now from the Yankees dugout here at Chase Stadium by Yankee manager Joe Torrey. Joe, many thanks for coming on with us. Yes, sir, John. Hey, Joe, you're getting a lot of guys on, but, you know, does the fact that you're missing two of your 100 RBIs guys change the way you're going to manage this ball game? Well, I, I think we got to think small, Joe. Uh, you know, even though we have the ability to do some things, I, I think having good at bats, which we are against Glavin, I, I mean, he always is able to wiggle off the hook uh, time and time again, but uh, we're trying to put some pressure on him. What about Gary Sheffield? I know you're not going to have Matt Suey back for a while. What about Gary? Well, Chef, I, I think we're about ready to send him uh, tomorrow to do a rehab game, and I think all he'll need is uh, one game, maybe two games. And before I leave, I want to say hello to my mother-in-law and father-in-law, Ed and uh, Lucille Walterman in Cincinnati. You know, just, Cincinnati, Joe, right? Yeah, you're right. John Miller was going to do it for you, but you did it yourself. All right, thanks, Joe. All right, guys. Get back. All right, Joe Torrey, and we uh, really appreciate Joe coming on yeah. between innings from the dugout, and we always want to make sure we're we're done with with that before he has to go back to work before the first pitch is thrown. So but that was Lucille and Ed Walterman, the parents of his wife Allie in Cincinnati, watching in in Cincinnati tonight. So we we too we join Joe, and we're happy to have them join our telecast tonight. This is Tom Glavin and that is a called strike from Aaron Small. It is on to Glavin hit a comeback for his first time. It wasn't really a comeback a little dribbler <laughs> that was handled by Aaron Small. 
The comebacker actually makes it all the way to the mound. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing that I got out of that was that Joe said that you know they're going to have to think small for a while. Well, he did that yesterday in the extra inning ball game. He um, Miguel Cairo stole second and then he stole third base, uh, set up the winning. You know, in the run 11th inning. in the eleventh inning, so they were thinking small ball yesterday, and it worked but for you, them. You pointed out yeah. why that was such a key yeah. that he stole third base. Well, he, he ordinarily you think, well, he's at second, he's in scoring position. It's a high risk to steal third. But you pointed out something yeah. that was sort of inside baseball as to why that might have helped Phillips get the pitch to the hit. Well, I definitely think so, because Jorge Julio was playing, was throwing the ball very well. He was throwing sliders. He struck the net out on a slider after. Miguel Cairo stole second base and he struck out Melky Cabrera on a slider both low sliders to strike them out. But after we saw Cairo steal third base well that took the low slider away because if he bounces it he could score. So they end up throwing him a fastball and he singled the center field. So that still a third took away one of his out pitches the out pitch that he was using in that inning earlier. Cano throws out Glavin. One away in the fifth. This is yesterday, Joe. Exactly what you're talking about in that 11th inning with Julio on the mound. See that low slider? That's what he was throwing to strike the hitters out. Look at that low slider. Now that was his out pitch. But when he stole third base, now that took that out pitch away. And look, he throws him a fastball up and he singles to center field. So that's what Joe Torre was talking about, small ball, and it really worked well for him in the 11th inning yesterday. It took Jorge Julio's best pitch away from him by stealing third base. Yeah, generally, as we see Reyes at the plate now, you think of a steal as being a tactical thing in terms of getting closer to being right. able to score, and yet there was an added wrinkle as to the value of that steal right there. Exactly, because you get over to third base, and it takes that low slider away from the pitcher because he doesn't want to bounce it and let you score the winning run. You know, even that I was thinking yesterday, when he stole the bag, because right. Ramon Castro did not throw the ball. Right. I mean, it's, it's kind of risky for Ramon Castro. I mean, you make exactly. a wild throw, you give away the winning run. Well, that's why they didn't throw, but that's the point of, of stealing the base. You put more pressure on the infield as well. That is a base hit, a broken back single through the middle for Reyes with one out in the fifth inning. When you get the third base with two outs, you force them to make the play. You can't knock the ball down anymore. So you have to be able to it just puts more pressure on all the infielders when you get to third base with two outs because they know that they can't knock it down anymore. They have to field it cleanly and then make the play to first base. So uh, I think it was very smart of Miguel Cairo to continue to steal second and then steal third base in that same at bat. So it was great. Small ball yeah. winning for the Yankees yesterday yeah. in the National League Park. But now you talk about stealing bases Joe we got a guy who can really steal him. Jose Reyes at first base. And right that's going to change the way that they pitch. In this at bat as well to Laduca. So Laduca, one for two, and they pitch out, right. thinking that Reyes is on the run. So now he's one ball, no strike, right? So you know if you're Laduca, you say, well, what are they going to do? They have to throw your fastball now. So you can either put a hit and run on if you're Willie Randolph, or Laduca can take a shot to right field in that hole over there. But he knows that he's going to get a fastball. If he gets anything else, he should take it. One ball, no strikes. And Reyes back to the bag with a dive. Reyes was uh, tutored this spring by none other than Ricky Henderson, the most Great. prolific base dealer of all time. Hired by the Mets. And, and Ricky did more than just coach base dealing and base running with Reyes, but Reyes was one of his projects in the spring. Well, he got the fastball, but he fouled it back. And that one comes back out of play. Is Stinnett gave chase. Let's take a look at this pitch on the Verizon Business K zone. As I said, he has to throw him a fastball after he pitched out. Right there, fastball, right at the top of the strike zone, and away, and he just fouls it back. But he knew he was sitting on a fastball. He got it, and he had a good swing at it. The Yankee bullpen is busy. There's Mike Myers, the left-handed submarine-type pitcher. Getting ready. You've got the switch hitting Beltran on deck, then the lefty Delgado after him. Fifth inning. Aaron Small again a throw to first. Diving back is Reyes. Reyes on base for the first time. He is he has had 16 steals, been thrown out five times this year. At the start of the day, he was tied for the league lead in steals with Felipe Lopez of Cincinnati. 
Scott Pesetnik, also a 16, was leading the American League when the day began. And I think he was going on that pitch, John. He had a little lean there, and he had stretched his lead out just a little bit. One of the things you can do as a base dealer, when you want to get a bigger lead, you come up closer to the pitcher on the inside of the baseline, and he can't tell how big your lead is. There he goes. Yep, I thought he was going. They, they pitched out too. the throw. Chief. The throw by Stanett tailed away a little bit. And Joe Torrey still thinks that Cano got him. Cano thought so. And I'm not so sure he didn't. It was a great swipe tag by Cano. But you could see that he was going. I told you I saw it on the pitch be before he threw the first base. So they immediately pitched out and they caught him going. But I, I think that we'll you'll have to wait and see. Now watch how quickly Cano makes the tag. Look at that. I mean, I, I don't if he tagged him, which I think he did, he should be out. I thought he was out. Now watch this. He swipes at him before he touches the bag. See his left hand does not touch the bag, it's his right hand. Now watch this. This is his right hand right there. I thought he was out. I mean, and it was a great tag by Cano. I mean, he, he just caught it and boom, right down on him. Now watch this. Watch the tag. Boom, right down on him. If he touched him, and yeah. that's what the that's the question. But I didn't see the umpire say that he missed it. He just said say. Yeah. So usually they'll tell you that you missed him if if they think that that's why he was safe. But the key there was the right hand rather than the left hand. Exactly. Was the one that went to the back. Yeah. He didn't go with the left hand, which was in front. And actually when the throws on that side you give him the limp right arm just bring the right arm behind you but you give him something to tag at that I mean that's a close tag so I'm um, you know we're looking in slow motion and we can't tell so the umpire has to make that yeah. judgment right away we can't tell if he actually tagged him exactly yeah. and we're looking in slow motion so very difficult for the umpire to make the right call we're looking in slow motion about four, four or five times we've been looking. <laughs> that's down the right field line. And uh, back out of play, Melky Cabrera gave chase, but it is in amongst the spectators. Three and two to Loduca. Remember the great at bat Loduca had to start off the fourth inning. I mean, he battled and battled, fouled off some tough pitches, and then finally got a base hit. And that was the beginning of the four run rally for the Mets. So I think Laduca's a perfect guy to hit in the number two spot in this lineup because he will take pitches, he'll shoot the ball the other way. He does so many things that are good in that position. And he doesn't strike out a lot. He will put the ball in play. So I think he's perfect to hit behind refs. He'll take strikes to let him steal the bag. Three and two. And he draws the walk. Loduca adds a lot, not just on the field, but off as well. He was a leader in that Dodger clubhouse. Peter Gammons is sitting down with the Mets dugout. And Peter, I know that uh, uh, from what we've heard, he's been a pretty good addition to this Mets clubhouse, too. Well, he's definitely. He's been the leader of the pitching staff in Los Angeles. He was the leader of the pitching staff when he was in Florida. And he works very closely with Rick Peterson. And as you know, it's been a little bit of a struggle this year because they've had some injuries on the pitching staff. But he's very important. He's a very selfless guy, which, as you know, is one of the most important characteristics for a well, indeed. And Leduc is getting that walk has sent Aaron Small to the showers. Here comes Mike Myers. Beltran and Delgado coming up. The left-handed specialist, number 36, Mike Myers, on to face Carlos Beltran, a switch hitter, but a hitter who has hit for a much lower batting average as a right-handed hitter. This is the first time Beltran has ever faced Myers in a big league game. Two men on, Reyes at second, Loduca at first. One out. And a pickoff play at second. Cano, too late to get Jose Reyes. I think this will be interesting, John. He said he's never faced him in, you know, big league game. I think if you've never seen a guy like Myers, you have to take a pitch. At least see where he's coming from so you can know where to look for the ball. Because normally you look off of a pitcher's shoulder, off his throwing shoulder. Well, with Myers, you got to look off his, his left knee. <laughs> you know, you can't look off where you normally do. So you take one and just take a look at it. Yeah. He kind of throws via first base yeah. and, and from down under. <laughs> so Beltran, who's hitting only 222 as a right handed hitter anyway, seeing a guy who's got a real funky delivery and seeing him for the first time. Right. Well, now Stinnett going to go out and talk to 
Myers here. So apparently they're at odds a little bit about what kind of a pitch to throw here. And, and also what happens John is you have a runner at second base who can steal third base and a left hander has a more difficult time holding the runner at second than a right hander does simply because when he whirls he's got to find the, the guy whereas if a right hander he sees the, it, it's easier for a right hander to make that turn and throw. Four to two the Mets already leading Aaron Small finish for the night there's that slider inside so he's seen one yeah. is that enough I, well, I don't think it is but, but uh, <laughs> hey I don't know if you can see enough but it definitely will help him see watch you look from the shoulder now where you're going to look from you're looking from the second baseman now to try to find that pitch as you see Cano is off the bag in the background one ball no strikes one out Cano jumps to the bag and Timeout was granted at home plate just before that pitch was thrown. So that pitch doesn't count. No. Cano jumped in the background to second base as if a, for a pickoff throw. Right. And Myers then threw the pitch. But as soon as Cano jumped to the bag, that's when Beltran asked for timeout. Well, there's also, you remember, he's looking, Beltran is looking out there and he can see Cano and you see him jump. I mean, that bothered, that distracts you as a hitter. Because he's throwing out of his shirt. That's hit kind of softly to Jeter. The second one, Cano back over to first, not in time to get the speedy Beltran. Reyes over to third base. And here comes Delgado now, fresh from his three run homer that turned the game around in the fourth inning. Well, he got a high fastball from. Aaron Small and hit it well over the right field wall to the back of the bullpen. High fastball and you can see by our blue track there that it wasn't much movement on it. Well the place erupted when he hit that one and the Yankees had just taken a two nothing lead and then Delgado it was the first pitch. They got a couple of men on and the first pitch boom. Well, Delgado is, is a, an aggressive hitter. He swings at a lot of first pitches. And they're a Mets fan and a Yankee fan side by side at Shea. And that's a called strike to Delgado. Delgado has seen Myers many times. He has one home run against him in nine career at bats, but has also struck out six of those nine at bats. Two down. Reyes at third, Beltran at first. Beltran is also a guy who can steal a bag, has five this year. That's going to be back out of play. Myers used to be in the National League and was sort of the, uh, the Barry Bond specialist. He was with two or three different National League West teams, but they always wanted him specifically for guys like Barry Bond. Yeah. Well, what they're doing at the mound now is they're trying to decide what they're going to do if Beltron takes off from first base. I think if you're Willie Randolph with an 0-2 count on Delgado, I don't think it's a bad play to try a double steal and just to see how the Yankees handle it. You can put a lot of pressure on the defense with the speed of Beltron at first and the speed of Reyes at, sec at third base. And you have an 0-2 count against one of your sluggers. If it doesn't work out, he can start. You know, you can have him starting fresh. Next inning because he's in a deep hole right now. Right. Nothing doing and that misses. Myers of course will be probably seen often in Fenway Park the next three nights because the David Red Sox Ortiz. have a guy named David Ortiz. Yeah. But David took him deep also earlier this he year. He did. Ortiz is two for three against him this year with that home run you're talking about. One ball and two strikes to Delgado. There they go. Or goes there goes yeah. one of them anyway, but the Yankees were just giving it to him. Well, that's the whole point right there. If you're the Mets, make them throw the ball someplace, and if they don't throw it, you get a run, free runner. You got one more runner in scoring position now, but you don't just stay at first base. If you stay at first base, you're playing right into their hands. Now watch there. You see Reyes down here. He's ready to go if they're going to throw the ball to second base, but you see no one covered. That tells you right there that the Yankees had already made up their mind they weren't going to do anything. They're just going to give him the bag. Two and two. Struck him out. The Mets strand two. 
in 60 seconds. We'll chat with Willie Randolph for the Mets dugout. Back in 60 with Willie Randolph after this. The big crowd at Shea Stadium. It's New York versus New York. And the Mets lead the Yankees 4-2. And we're happy now to be joined by Willie Randolph in his second year as the manager of the Mets from the Mets dugout. Willie, welcome How to Sunday Night Baseball. Good. Well, All right. I, I want to start off with a bad question. How tough was that loss yesterday? Oh, very, very difficult. Uh, the dinner didn't taste too good and didn't sleep too well last night. You know, we had it in the bag. And uh, with Billy Wagner coming in the, in the game, you thought you had it was, you know, was made. All right, also, you know, your starting pitching now is not the same starting pitching you look like you're going to have at the beginning of the season. Yeah, well, you know, we've had some injuries in the fourth and fifth spots, and uh, we're trying to fill them up. You know, we just sent Jose Lima out. He was 0-3, and, and Jerry Gonzalez might get a start the next time around, but we need somebody to step up in that spot, guys. And what about, are you happy with your bullpen other than yesterday's performance? Yes, bullpen's been outstanding. Our middle relief's been great. Uh, Aaron uh, Sanchez and, and the guys in front of him have been outstanding. And uh, outside of yesterday, um, Wagner's been superb also. Hey, would, would you use Wagner tonight if the situation oh, yeah. presented itself? Yeah, to get him back in there, man. The closers want to get the ball again, and uh, I'll be looking forward to getting him back in there. All right, Willie. All right, good luck, Willie. Okay, guys, take care. Yeah. Many thanks to Willie Randolph from the Mets dugout live. As we now go to the sixth inning, Tom Glavin. Just misses outside with ball one to Kelly Stinnett. John, you brought up a point. You asked him would he use really random, I mean, would he use Wagner today? And a lot of people were questioning him using him yesterday because they had a four run lead. Well, you know, my thoughts on that is this you didn't bring Billy Wagner over here to close all your ball games. You brought him over here to help you win ball games. And a win yesterday would have gone a long way toward, you know, this ball club being where they wanted to be. So if you're saying that they shouldn't have brought Wagner in because it wasn't a safe situation, you're also saying Joe Torre shouldn't have brought Mariano Rivera in because it wasn't a safe situation. But Torre was using Mariano not to save the game, but to help him win the game. Yeah. And so you use Wagner the same way. Stinnett down on strikes, and now we go back to yesterday, and, and Billy Wagner in that ninth inning gave up only two hits, but he... He was walking guys and hitting guys. He just was all over the place. Yeah. And, it, and it appeared that he was trying to go throw harder and harder when he got in trouble. He and hit Bernie Williams with his slider. Threw over 30 pitches. So here is Kevin Reese now as a pinch hitter for Mike Myers, and he takes ball one. But also, you know, I think sometimes with, with, a, with a closer, especially when he's had a bad one like yesterday, he would like to get right back yeah. in there and get that bad taste out of his mouth. Yeah. I remember a, a great quote from Raleigh Fingers. He said, sometimes you tame the tiger, sometimes you get eaten by the tiger. But you got to get back out there either way. <laughs> Glavin hits Reese who had turned around as hit the bunt. Got drilled right in the back. And I don't know how much longer Glavin's going to go. I was wondering the same thing, John, because that pitch was way off. <laughs> That wasn't even close to where he had in mind. So he hits the rookie, Reese, up there as a pinch hitter. Watch how far this ball is inside. It's not even close to the target. The target's actually toward the outside. You can see LaDuca reach way across his body to try to catch it. So now Johnny Damon, who also got hit by a pitch the last time he was up there. And that's ball one. That was the 100th pitch of the game from Tom Glavin. And he doesn't often work more than that. He's well, five and a third. And you see he's, he's almost thrown as many out of the strike zone as in. Left field. That's falling. Floyd. He traps it. That is not a catch. Larry Young, the third base umpire, went out and immediately signaled no catch. So a single for Damon. Good job by... Floyd to try to get into the catch and a good job by Larry Young to get out there and make sure he didn't catch it. You could clearly see the ball hits the ground, but a good job by Floyd to keep it in front of him. So now Floyd trapping the ball. That was what it could have gotten away and turned into an extra base hit. Yeah, but you're also in a situation again where, I mean, he hasn't fooled Jeter the entire ball game. Jeter is two for three with two battered in, and he fouls one off to the right. The Mets bullpen has been quiet all the while. 
We are at Shea Stadium. Game three of the Subway Series. All New York. And now the Mets get the bullpen going. Feliciano is the left hander and Chad Bradford the right hander. And they're just starting to throw now. On one to Jeter. Jeter knocked in the first two runs of this game with a bases loaded single in the fourth inning. Actually, off the glove of the third baseman, David Wright. And you can tell how a guy takes pitches whether he's very comfortable in seeing the ball well off of a pitcher. And he's seeing the ball well off of Glavin. Fastball strike on the inside, down around the knees. Jeter thought maybe it was a little bit too low. But that was that nine iron that added to his bag because he went away with a fastball and just missed and he came back inside with a fastball something that he normally would not have done meaning Glavin he usually just would stay away Jeter hit a memorable three run homer against Glavin at Yankee Stadium in the 1998 World Series that is foul off to the right Glavin remember had gotten sick on the eve of game one of that World Series and was supposed to be the game one started couldn't make it. And in the I said 98 1999 World Series 98 was the Padres. I didn't know the difference either anyway. But when he did pitch he was at Yankee Stadium and he pitched well he had a five to two lead late in the game. And Jeter hit a three run homer to tie that game against him. And the Yankees went on to sweep the World Series. So they have some history in the past. And that's a long time ago now seven years ago. Jeter has been the only Yankee to get a hit with a runner in scoring position tonight. The Yanks have had a lot of chances. They've had seven hits against Glavin, three walks, two hit batsmen. They've put 12 men on base, but only two runs. There is Reyes. One, the first, two. A double play. On maybe the final pitch we'll see from Glavin tonight. David Wright coming up for the Mets. Sunday night baseball from Shea Stadium and uh, it seems like all of New York is here tonight. The Mets leading the Yankees in this interleague battle four to two as we head to the last of the sixth inning Tom Glavin over 100 pitches thrown for the game and he's been under duress all night long. It's remarkable the Yankees have only scored well, two you're right game. but he's made some great pitches. He actually pitched Jeter perfectly there because Jeter was on just about every pitch. He got the ground ball to get him out of the jam. And this pitcher, by the way, way inside to David Wright, the side armor, Coulter Bean. And he immediately invokes the wrath of the, the <laughs> Mets faithful. Remember the last time he was up there, David Wright hit a spectacular home run beyond the visiting bullpen here at Shea. He is also lined out to first. Coulter Bean spins one in there for a strike. Bean out of Auburn University. He holds Auburn's record with 108 games pitched during his NCAA career and he has been in the Yankees farm system all the way back since into night or to 2000 actually at one time the the Red Sox claimed him on a rule five draft but then returned him before that spring training had ended Coulter Bean and the Yankees you know they're just shorthanded all the way around right so Bean was brought up in the minor leagues yesterday. And he, there's one of those little frisbees over the outside. Strike two. Cliff Floyd, the left-handed slugger, is on deck. So Myers went two-thirds of an inning, did his job, which he's been doing most of the time except for that one time when David Ortiz got to him. Two and two the count. And he tried that slider to the inside but missed with it. Three and two. This guy's big, isn't he? Coulter yeah, Bean. 6'6. Six, 6'6. Six. <laughs> six, six, yeah. That's a power forward. Randy Johnson. I think Coulter Bean used to block for Joe Namath. <laughs> That's a foul right back. And uh, the count's still 3 and 2 to David Wright. Wright's home run in the fourth inning. His sixth of the year. Got 28 runs battered in. Hitting well over 300. The Mets lead four to two in the sixth inning. The Yankees started the night with an emergency starter. Aaron Small who had to go in place of Sean Chacon who couldn't make it because of an injury. And he strikes him out. 
But he kept throwing that slider and curveball until he got him. We talked about the last at bat. Jeter was right on everything, so he wasn't going to fool him. So he had to make good pitches. Watch this at bat. Fastball on the outside edge, off the outside edge, back on the inside. Then he goes back away with a fastball, and he goes away with another sinker. Now watch, that's the key. Watch the ball sink. And Jeter hits it on the ground. It's exactly what Glavin wanted. But he did not fool Jeter with any of those pitches. He just made good pitches. And the Mets bullpen is busy right now. So they have the lead four to two and we as you see Aaron Heilman getting ready out there. We've probably seen the last of Glavin. Heilman has just been uh, very reliable coming out of the bullpen. There's a because they're missing two of their five starting pitchers is certainly a temptation to bring Heilman in as a starting pitcher. But uh, Willie Randolph and company they feel like well he's just been too valuable out of the pen. Well that's what Willie said remember he said his bullpen has been great. Floyd to shallow left Bernie Williams on the run now he abruptly has to put the brakes on and makes the catch Peter Gammons is downstairs by the Mets dugout and Peter uh, there's a lot of chalk that the Mets would like to maybe go acquire a, 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 another proven starting <laughs> pitcher. What do you think? Well, all Marvin and I has really worked hard at it. The problem he says he has is that where three years ago they, they were they were always teams that wanted to dump contracts. Right now, everybody's making money. They're not. They, they, there are no contracts to be dumped. And right now, there's nothing out on the trade market without giving up Lasting's Miller. So, you know, he's looking. They really don't want to move Aaron Heilman out of the bullpen. They're going to bring up. Ale Soler from from uh, Double A to pitch one game this week. They hope to eventually get John Maine back. They hope to get Brian Bannister back. Like the Yankees with their lineup, the Mets are just going to try to survive for a while. So and Soler is the Cuban emigre. Yes, he's somewhere between 26 and 29. <laughs> but also, uh, Peter, they're going to like you said, they're going to need two starters. They're going to bring up a couple of guys. To try to help out here, I think uh, they may have to start Jeremy Gonzalez one more time, and uh, there's a lot of talk of Mike Pelfrey, who was their big bonus board that they signed out of uh, Wichita State last summer, but he has struggled since he's got up to Double A. He has no off-speed pitch. He throws very hard, but the Eastern League is hitting 356 off Pelfrey, so he may be a ways away. He needs to develop his secondary pitches. And, and a guy that a lot of teams ask for in trades too, right? Pelfrey. Pelfrey and 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 Lastix Millage and Omar Manaya looks at he looks at this team a little bit like the Yankees were in the mid 90s. He's got Reyes. He's got Wright. Beltran's only 28. He's got Lastix Millage. He's got Pelfrey. You know, he wants to hold on to those players and build a team that's going to be be in contention for the next eight years. Kazmatsui, the hitter with a runner at first, two down after Xavier Nader got hit on a pitch there from. Uh, Coulter Bean, it's four to two. The Mets lead. There goes Nady, the throw, and he steals it. Well, you have no chance with Bean's motion. Very slow. He drops down. He moves to the side, so you have plenty of time. And one of the things with tall guys or big guys, they very rarely will they have a good move. See how long it takes him to release the ball, and look where Xavier Nady is. In fact, he looked back to see where the pitch was. So he thought he had plenty of time. Jeter never even got a tag on him. So now Matsui could not get a run with a base hit. Valentin has come out on deck with the pitcher spot due up next. And there is Jose Valentin, the veteran, who's hit a couple of home runs here lately. But you know, Peter mentioned something, Joe, about the Yankees in the mid 90s. You know, Bernie Williams probably could have been traded 25 different times when he was a top prospect in the farm system. And I think that goes back to Gene Michael was the GM at that time. And he said no we've got to keep these young guys. We have some guys who are untouchables. And Peter that's I think it was Gene Michael's the, the, the era that you're talking about right. Absolutely it was Gene Michael and, and Buck Showalter and they had Derek Jeter. They had they had Rivera. They had Pettit. They had Posada coming up through the farm system and Bernie Williams. And they built a team that won four World Series. What a great play there by Jeter. He was obstructed from seeing that ball by Nady, but made the play nonetheless. Big hitters coming up for the Yanks. Giambi, A Rod, and Cano when we return. ESPN, Sunday Night Baseball from Shea Stadium, New York. It's a New York kind of a thing. It's a New York state of mind. 
I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, Peter Gammon, Sam Ryan, our Sunday night crew. And there is Aaron Heilman. Look at that ERA 1.48, 23 strikeouts, six walks in 24 and a third innings. And uh, the batting average against him is only 200. So he's been awfully tough. He pitched three shutout innings here, the six, seven, and eighth innings in their come from behind victory on Friday night. And he pitched them perfectly. No runs, no hits, no walks. Giambi the hitter. Tonight, though, Joe, they do not make a double switch. So he'll be due to lead off in the last of the seventh. The plan is when they're ahead like this, late innings, Heilman seventh, Duaner Sanchez for the eighth, and Billy Wagner for the ninth. Well, and one, that is low. One thing, Billy Wagner threw 12 pitches to close out Friday night's game. And I think you said he threw 30 yesterday. So you know that that's that's 42 pitches obviously in the two two games. 32. Yeah, 32 yesterday. So 44 pitches he's thrown in this weekend. And ordinarily they might want to give him a day off today. Yeah. But it was a bad day. It's the Yankees. They have a day off tomorrow before Philadelphia comes in. Three and one the count to Jason Giambi. A Rod on deck. Ooh, a mighty cut, and Heilman had a little. Uh, what do you? How do you? What do you say there, Joe? Ninety-four mile hour, a little. Uh, a little giddy up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at the Verizon Business K Zone. I think we'll see some movement as well as some speed. Fastball. Well, not a lot of movement. That's just some giddy up right there. The movement came right back, right down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three and two. Giambi, center field, and Beltran. That's off in the graveyard in this ballpark. And then remember, there's, there's a lot of wind blowing in tonight. Let's take a look at our Lowe's home team advantage. And uh, the Mets, with the huge Alex crowds, Rodriguez. the seventh and eighth largest crowds in the history of Shea Stadium. And their three largest crowds last year were when the Yankees came here. Although, if it's their home stadium, we don't know what the crowd officially is tonight. We know it's 56 something more, more than likely, but they're also. Make no mistake about it, a lot of Yankee fans in the stands here tonight and through the weekend. That's strike one to Alex Rodriguez. A Rod, the MVP in the American League, with a two run lead, you want to face him with nobody on base. Correct. A Rod has walked, flagged to shallow left, and lined hard to left. He's 0 for 2. Changed up on it. Wow. 0 and 2. And when he lined hard to left, the bases were loaded. That was a big moment. Well, there's a change up. And you can see a dip right there at the end. And he swung right over the top of it. Oh, and two. In the dirt. That was in the fourth inning, Joe. They had already scored two runs and had the bases loaded. And it was right at a time where a base hit could have really opened it up. That was a big moment in this game. One of several, though, for the Yankees because they had a lot of other at bats just like that. On a night where they have had 12 men reach base in the first six innings and only got two of them home. One out, nobody on. Well, he's really keeping it down. Look at that one 96 miles an hour in our radar gun, but too low. Aaron Heilman. We're talking about how. He was a, an option for the Mets. They could because he's been a starting pitcher, and he wanted to be the option. He wanted to go back into that rotation. But the Mets said, "Well, you're just too good. You've been too good out of the bullpen. We can't afford it." It's that age-old argument. I can use you a lot of times to help set up wins. As a starter, you're going to pitch once every fifth day, but sure. you're going to give me more innings. Two and two to A. Rod. Back to Heilman. Out number two. Peter Gammons is down by the Mets dugout. And Peter, what do you think? Heilman too valuable for the Mets to start him? Well, they just feel, John, that for one thing, that Willie Randolph believes he's so good against left-handed hitters with this, with this changeup. The, the rest of his bullpen with Julio and, and with Sanchez in front of Billy Wagner is dominated by right-handers. They really like They also love the fact that he can give them some length. He can pitch one inning, two innings, three innings. Right now, they don't want to make the move. If it gets into July and things haven't been resolved, they don't get Bannister and Maine back, well, perhaps they'll move him back into the rotation. Robinson Cano off the fists. 
Goes the other way with a base hit as Floyd gets it back in. That's the first hit for Cano. And that's the first hit allowed by Heilman in this series after throwing three no hit innings here Friday night. Well, he made the first mistake. He got the ball up a little bit. He was down with all the pitches to A Rod. He got that one up, even though he jammed him. It was a fly ball instead of the ground ball. Now, you know, and Heilman's got excellent stuff, Joe, but, you know, I, it wasn't when he was a starter, it wasn't like he was one of the right. top aces of the staff. Well, he might have found his perfect niche here. And, you, and I'm, that's probably one of the reasons Willie doesn't want to change him and, and take him back to starting. And that is a little bit low for ball one to Bernie Williams. I mean, that was a problem all last year for the Mets. They could take leads into the seventh, eighth innings, but all too often they didn't hold those leads. Right. Now they look pretty solid. You get them through six innings, it's going to be tough to come back on them. Although the Yankees did so yesterday in the ninth inning. I mean, which was more impressive? That one by Loduca. And Cano moves up into scoring position now. Bernie's had two doubles tonight and a walk. To try and drive him in and make this a one run game. What was more impressive? The Yankees down by nine to Texas as late as the third, and they were down 10 to one, and they won. Or down 4 nothing in the ninth inning yesterday with Billy Wagner coming in, and they won that one. Well, I think yesterday's was more impressive simply because you only have three outs left. And you go down early in the ballgame, you have plenty of time with their sticks that, you know, they have in their ball club. But with three outs remaining and you're four runs down, uh, you're not going to win too many ball games in that situation, even whether it's Billy Wagner on the hill or any other closer. Well, Joe Torrey agrees with you. I asked him the same question. Yeah. And he said, well, you have to understand for eight innings we didn't do anything right exactly. we didn't hit a loud foul ball off of Pedro and then Duaner Sanchez in the eighth inning right. just throttled him just Mariano Rivera and Joe Choi said before the game tonight Mariano is not coming in in the ninth inning to save one tonight not with the Red Sox lurking he's worked in both games of this series already and two tough innings yesterday but well, Bernie draws a walk so the single by Cano now Williams walks. Bernie's been on base four straight times tonight. And the problem you have is that yesterday they helped the Yankees come back. And you're starting to help them now when you walk a guy when you only have a two run lead. Red Sox Yankees tomorrow 7 o'clock on ESPN from Fenway Park. Chin Ming Long versus Kurt Schilling at Fenway. And the uh, Dave O'Brien and Rick Sutcliffe will be there to bring it to that will also be available on ESPN HD starting at seven o'clock tomorrow. All right. Can the Yankees get a hit with a runner in scoring position. One hit in 12 such at bats tonight as a team. Here is Melky Cabrera to change up misses low. One for 12. They've left nine men on. Two men on right now. Cano at second. Bernie at first. But two down. Fastball, a strike. So a big moment for the rookie. Cabrera, who was up there with the runner at second in the second and nobody out, and moved him over to third with a ground out. Second, nobody out in the fourth, hit a comebacker and didn't move him up at all, and hit a, an inning ending double play in the fifth inning. 0 for 3. Just off the inside with a fastball. Cabrera up from the minor leagues. There's Joe Chory. In the foreground, Lee Mazzilli back with the Yankees as a coach after managing the Orioles for a while. And too low with a changeup. So he's used that changeup twice in the sequence, but Cabrera took both out of the strike zone. Has he taken that changeup away from him, Joe? Well, I think also, I think that, yeah, but it, he can't throw him another changeup. But the real problem is. I mean, you're digging a hole for yourself. Now he can sit on a fastball and maybe drive it. Kelly Stinnett, a right-handed hitter on deck. If you walk him, you move the possible tying run into scoring position. Three and one. Fastball, a strike. Cabrera, only 21 years old. Well, you're going to give the tying run a chance to start. Break from first base with a 3-2 pitch, two outs. 
Cano at second, Williams at first. There they go. He walked him. He threw him the changeup. And he has, free of charge, moved the possible tying run into scoring position. And the possible lead run for the Yankees has been given first base. Well, I guess he threw that pitch simply because, you know, Kelly Stanett was the next hitter. But I, I can't walk the tying run in the scoring position. And you can't walk. When you have a two-run lead, you shouldn't walk anyone. Make them earn their way on, and they didn't do that. And so we've also seen that in, you know, with Billy Wagner yesterday trying to close the game out. So the Mets, you know, are their own worst enemy here trying to close these ball games out against the Yankees. Well, I mean, this is a little too eerily similar to the right. ninth inning yesterday. Yeah. And this started, the one thing that Heilman's got to his advantage, it started after two were down and nobody on. Yeah. The single by Cano now, but two straight walks. And here is Stinnett, a base hit could tie this game. Stinnett is 0 for 2 with a walk. And that is a strike. He got the low strike. And Stinnett argues with Tom Hallian. The Yankees have Jorge Posada, but they can't use him. Yeah, he's just not ready to right, play right. That yeah, back, right. and he would have to go in. As you can see, the movement, good sinking action on the fastball. Definitely a strike. 0 and 1. Off the outside. So he needs the foul to change up and just go after him try to spot the fastball. There is yesterday's hero for the Yankees Andy Phillips on deck Ron Villone the left hander up in the Yankee bullpen three men on two men out Reyes to second in time and the inning is over Matsui took the throw that was a squibber. And a tough hop for Reyes, but he got it done. Three more left on for the Yankees. Four to two Mets. All of New York has come to Shea Stadium, it seems, tonight, including Philip Seymour Hoffman, who won the Academy Award for Best Actor this year for his role in Capote. And he's also a great bad guy in the Mission Impossible movie. Looks like he's an Oriole fan, though. Well, I would, he, he probably could get a better hat than that if he won an Academy <laughs> Award, right? Peter Gammons is downstairs. Peter. Well, gentlemen, you know, Alex Rodriguez has struggled in the field recently at times, and he's had some problems in the clutch, but it seems he can't ever do enough. This is a guy who had 48 home runs last season. was the MVP. One wonders how different would it be if his original deal with the Red Sox had gone through. He wouldn't be in the shadow of Derek Jeter. He wouldn't have to hear about how he hasn't won a ring, which Don Mattingly didn't either, and he would be at shortstop, which he played better than anyone else in the American League before the deal. If he approached 500, 600, maybe 700 homers as a shortstop he would be regarded as one of the greatest players in the history of baseball as a Yankee until and if he's an October hero he'll only be compared to monuments well and that's a real good point yeah I, I think you know looking back I mean Yankee fans some of them that the, the may disagree to good Yankee fans will say that they're glad to have him as a Yankee but I think you know it, it might have been a better fit for him to go to Boston because he could play shortstop and he has struggled this year a little bit at third base. Jose Valentin the pinch hitter for Aaron Heilman leading off here in the last of the seventh against Coulter Bean lead off man Jose Reyes on deck and then Paulo Duca. I well, mean he was he was a gold glove shortstop yeah, and he gave that up to play third base and I tell you what all the shortstops I've ever known the Ozzy Smith the great ones of the world the uh, Omar Vizcals, they did not want to move from shortstop. That was their position. Ozzy Smith said he would, he came in as a shortstop and he would leave as a shortstop. And he did. So Omar Vizcals, the same thing. He's going to come in as a shortstop and he's going to leave as a shortstop. Valentin gets a walk to start the seventh. Then we go to the top of the order for Red. Peter is downstairs. And Peter, I mean, that was. That was a major thing. I, not just one of the greatest players in the game, maybe the best in the game when he came here, but as a shortstop, knowing that to come here, he had to move positions. It was huge. Well, it's very different. Third base is obviously a great position, but it's a lot different when you're putting up that production as shortstop. Cal Ripken changed the nature of offensive shortstops. I mean, Alex had a chance. As I said, it, it was a shortstop, and he hit 700 home runs. 
And he, I think that, you know, we'd be arguing, okay, Ruth, Alex, Mays, Aaron, and as a third baseman, I'm not sure that argument is ever going to happen. Alex Rodriguez right there with the most home runs before age 31. <laughs> and some very select company. And, I mean, he's well on his way. I mean, Barry Bonds hit number 714 to tie the babe yesterday out in Oakland. And A-Rod is ahead of where Barry Bonds was. He's ahead of where everybody was at his age. Reyes runs up as if to bunt, and he took that one from Bean. Ball one. Well, let's make no mistake about it. There's a long way from 438 to 714. You know, there, we looked at Ken Griffey Jr. a few years ago, and we thought he was going to be the first guy to get there. Henry. A lot of things can happen between 438 and 714. Joe Torrey after that pitch and Coulter Bean having a hard time. He had not thrown a strike in this inning yet. And Joe says we got to get somebody in here to throw a strike. So the pitching change has been made and we'll be right back. It all happened in a the twinkling of an eye. One minute the Yankees were ahead 2 nothing, and then Delgado's three run homer and right behind it a, a booming shot by David Wright and the Mets were ahead 4 to 2 and they are still leading 4 to 2 last of the seventh inning and there is Ron Vallone the veteran left hander on in relief of Coulter Bean who suddenly just could not find the strike zone in this inning. A four pitch walk to the pinch hit of Valentin and then ball one way out of the zone to Reyes and he's gone. Reyes batting right handed. Push butt up the first base side. Giambi lets it roll foul and it's immediately picked up by Valone to make sure that it stayed foul. Good idea there by Reyes. Again don't just give yourself up. So I, one of the things I've always felt like is one of your if you have a lot of speed don't just square around and give it away. You know, unless you're in the ninth inning where you have to move the runner over. See, he's trying to push the ball right through here, and then he would beat it out. But he can't get it through there. He hits it foul, but that's okay. And now, if you want to, just square around and drop it down. Juan Duca on deck. Valentin at first. Third baseman. A-Rod very shallow in the air again and again Giambi lets it roll foul. Well I said I liked the first one I don't like it the second time. <laughs> well because you, you gave it a shot it didn't work now go ahead and butt the guy over to second base. OK. So now it's an all or nothing kind yeah. of play. Yeah. Maybe now, they'll take the exactly. butt off. Now it's one and two you can't bunt again. Not with a good hitter. I mean not with one of your you know young players that you're trying to bring along. I think you have to go ahead and let him swing now but. I think that was a situation where there you just square around and get move him over. You see how the Yankees are playing. A-Rod still will play a little bit shallow at third. Valentin the runner at first. Loduca on deck. Then all the power guys. Beltran, Delgado, Wright, Floyd. The Mets leading four to two trying to win one for Tom Glavin. Who went the first six innings. And remember the Yankees. I mean they're missing some people but they have been 11 and two this year. Hitting 296 against lefties, but 11 and 2 when lefties started against them. Here's Mike Messina, who pitched yesterday against Pedro Martinez. He'd been the ace for the Yankees this year. He'd been excellent, six and one for them. Almost got him in the foot. There goes Valentin. A one-hop throw, and he's in there. Wow. Well, I mean that—that's <laughs> heads-up base running right there. One of the things you're taught as a base runner is anytime you see the ball going down low, you anticipate that it's going to get away from the catcher. And watch where this pitch is. And Valentin, he wasn't stealing, but he sees the ball down low and he takes off. If you anticipate that the ball is going to get away when it's that low, you're going to be right most of the time. So good job there by Valentin to get to second base. He scored as a wild pitch. And Reyes with a wild swing of the pitch that was way out of the strike zone. And that is out number one. 
Tom Glavin, we were talking about his night. He was uh, very much uh, impressive, I thought, with all of the, the trouble the Yankees were giving him. He's standing by down outside the clubhouse with Sam Ryan. Sam? That's right, John. 107 pitches for Tom Glavin. Got out of some key jams in the fourth against Alex and in the sixth against Derek. What was key for you? Just making a decent pitch when I had to. Um, you know, I didn't have real good field, especially in my fastball tonight, so my location wasn't great. I was pitching behind the count a lot, but uh, it's just one of those things, I guess, where experience helps you, and you just keep reminding yourself you got to make one good pitch to get out of the inning, and I was fortunate to do it a number of times. Okay, so they did have the leadoff batter on three of the first four innings. How do you change your approach when that happens? You know, just uh, keep trying to make pitches, you know. I, I mean, you get to the point where you, I mean, believe me, I know it, and I'm like, God, let's just have one easy inning here and, and try and get through it one, two, three. But, you know, some nights are like that. Some nights you got to battle and, and find ways to get through it. And, and uh, you know, the nights that it's easy or that everything is on are supposed to be easy. But nights like tonight are games that you could very easily lose. But uh, you're trying to find a way to just find something that feels right and, and keep trying to make a pitch. And like I said, the guys made some great double plays behind me, so it was, uh, turned out well. Have you spoken to Billy Wagner after yesterday's game? Uh, a little bit. You know, Billy's, uh, I've been really impressed with his ability to bounce back. I mean, he's uh, he's never taken it the next day to the ballpark with him. He, he's pretty good at blowing it off. And, you know, he felt he felt worse than anybody yesterday. And, and uh, you know, that's going to happen. We all know he's trying hard. We all know he doesn't want to do that, obviously. But, um, you know, if he's going to struggle, we'd rather him do it now and get it out of the way and be solid for us the rest of the year, which we know he's going to be. And we'll see if the Mets can get you your seventh win of the season tonight. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. My pleasure. And thanks, Sam, and uh, many thanks to Tom for coming on with us there. And that, that that's a pretty good start for an old guy. <laughs> if he can go seven and two this this early in the season, only a couple of guys have won seven so far. I think uh, Kenny Rogers of that amazing Detroit Tigers ball club, Jim Leland's ball club, moved into first place in the American League Central today with a win over Cincinnati. How about that? They got one run and they won. Beat a slugging Reds team one to nothing today. But their pitching has been sensational. Brandon Webb leads the National League with seven wins. Freddie Garcia of the White Sox, Kenny Rogers of Detroit with seven in the American League. And uh, Scott Casimir won number seven today for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. It might be a sore subject for the Mets. Remember, they Scott Casimir was their guy. He was the uh, he was traded to Tampa Bay in the deal that brought Victor Zambrano here. And now Victor Zambrano's career might be over. Casimir eight shutout innings against the Young Marlins. He beat Dontrell Willis today. July of 2004. Omar Minaya was not the No, he wasn't there. here. He was not here. 11 strikeouts, one walk for Casimir. He's getting better and better. Scott Casimir popped up. Jeter. On a windy night. And it finally comes down. That was that was way up there. Two down and Beltran coming up. Tom Glavin. He was uh, sailing stormy seas most of the night. But they did turn a spectacular double play there. Matsui to Reyes to first. And then Reyes handled it himself that time. That was on Jeter with a couple of men on in the sixth inning. So Glavin, 281 wins in his career, two Cy Young awards, and he was a disappointment after coming to the Mets. But midseason last year and early on this year, he seems to have found himself again. He's pitching better than ever, Joe. Well, he's been pitching very well. You're right. I mean, he got off to a great start. The key, I think, for veteran players is to get off to a good start. Then you don't have to answer all those questions about are you getting too old? Are you, you know, running out of gas here? Glavin began the night with an earned run average of 2.43. Six innings, two runs allowed tonight. Beltran, that's too low from Villon. Glavin had the second best ERA in the league when the evening began. Behind only the former Red Sox right-hander, Bronson Arroyo has become an ace for the Cincinnati Reds early on this year. Another surprising story early in the season. I mean, it's early. It's, oh, oh, well, we're well, about we're a the quarter. one quarter of the way yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. Duaner Sanchez, an off-season acquisition by Omar Minaya, who has been outstanding as a setup man, getting ready for the eighth inning. The Mets are trying to squeeze out another run here. 
Beltran trying to bring Valentin home from second. Right to Jeter. Delgado left on deck. On to the eighth. The pitcher's spot. Then Damon and Jeter. Giambi do fourth. The Yankees trail. Sunday night baseball from Shea Stadium, New York. And the New York Yankees trailing the New York Mets in this interleague battle. The Subway Series rubber match of the weekend. The Mets lead 4-2. And there is Duaner Sanchez, former Dodger, who has become a key member of the Mets bullpen, 26-year-old right-hander from the Dominican Republic. Sanchez, who did some closing late last season in L.A. And Joe, this guy, he throws hard with a lot of movement. Yeah, he's got great stuff. Miguel Cairo is the pinch hitter for Ron Vallone. And that's a corn strike at the knees. Cairo thought maybe a little bit too low. Well, the one thing that we're seeing here, and I think it's a direct influence from Peterson, the, the pitching coach, is that is you're seeing that everyone is keeping the ball down. All the Mets pitchers are pitching down in the strike zone and down and out of the strike zone. And that is too far down. You see that sinking action, 96 miles an hour and There's sinking. Rick Peterson, the pitching coach that I was speaking of. He's got these guys, everyone just go back to the beginning of this ball game. Everyone has pitched for them have tried to keep the ball down, and they have been doing a great job. And too far too down low. again. Yeah. <laughs> well, Heidman, Howman was pitching well, then all of a sudden he started missing low, but they were low. They, they're not getting up in the strike zone, which obviously helps you keep the ball in the ballpark if you keep the ball down. Two and one the count. The top of the order comes up next. And that's oh. too low. Well, that's the idea usually against a sinker baller, right? If, if the pitch is coming in around the knees, you take it. Take it. Well, he threw the first pitch for a strike, and now you've thrown three balls in a row. I mean, it looks like Heilman after he retired the first couple of hitters. Scott Erickson, the veteran right handed, getting ready in the Yankee bullpen with Cairo pinch hitting for the pitcher Ballone. Pedro Martinez, who looked like a winner yesterday, seven shutout innings. And that is ball four to Cairo. Wow. Well, one thing that they're, they're doing, they're giving the Yankees a lot of chances. Johnny Damon. Hit batsmen, walking guys. Andy Chavez now in left field, replacing Cliff Floyd, a defensive change. 56,205, the paid crowd tonight at Shea. Johnny Damon, and that's ball one. What's what's happening with this Mets bullpen all of a sudden? Yeah, I, I think part of it, John, is the wind conditioned out there. I think it's a little windy, and all of a sudden, you know, we're seeing guys unable to throw strikes. Now, yesterday, what was it? Because <laughs> it started with uh, Billy Wagner in the ninth inning yesterday. The flag, the wind has picked up. And that is up on the upper roof of the stadium above the first base side. Johnny Damon. A strike. Damon has been on base three times tonight. Two base hits. He was also hit by a pitch. And all of that was up against uh, Tom Glavin. A walk to start the inning. Heilman walked two in a row after two were down in the seventh inning. Little tap. That's going to be a, try, a problem and a base hit. The third hit of the game for Damon. The batter will be Jeter with two on and nobody out. Now, we mentioned that Andy Chavez went in for Cliff Floyd. He was due up third in the last of the eighth inning. And Sam Ryan's got a report. Sam? It's on an outside of the Mets clubhouse right now. That's where Cliff Floyd is. He's being checked out. He uh, appeared to have injured his left shoulder. He was holding it. It take, took him out of the game for precautionary reasons. But right now they are checking out that left shoulder. All right, Sam. Thank you. And uh, he might have done something in that play where he almost made the uh, the catch. Jeter looking to bunt. He took it for ball one. Jeter has driven in the Yankees' only runs tonight. He is two for four. Two batted in, hitting 347 for the season. He started the day fourth in the American League in batting average. Damon over at first is the possible tying run of the game. Cairo at second.
Jeter shows bunt again. You got Giambi on deck. And Rodriguez, but is he is he bunting for a straight yeah. sacrifice? Yeah, he was quite, he was going to sacrifice. And again, I mean, we see the pitches; all of them are down, which is one thing they're trying to do, but they're missing too low. It's a cool, windy night at Shea Stadium. I would be surprised if they go ahead and have Jeter bunt now. Two balls, no strikes. The guy's a little erratic. You don't want to give him an out by throwing one pitch in the strike zone. I think they're going to let him hit. The Yankees have had 18 men reach base tonight. So far, only two runs. But it was not until the ninth inning last night that they did anything at all, or yesterday afternoon, and they won that game. 2-0. Jeter shows bunt. Pops it up. Trapped by Sanchez. No catch. Everybody safe. Sanchez went for the catch. Well, Jeter got the ball down. Uh, again, I'm surprised, but he does get the job done. He gets a base hit. And now they're worried about Sanchez. One of the Mets trainers out to have a look. Well, he might have injured his left shoulder as well. Because he lands on it awkwardly. Like that's exactly what happened to Cliff Floyd. And you jam your left shoulder into the ground. Watch your left shoulder right there. I mean, it's the same play, basically. Yeah. Suddenly, the Yankees had the bases loaded. And their best sluggers, Giambi, and then Alex Rodriguez coming up. Yeah. They couldn't have asked for a better opportunity than this. And Sanchez is, Willie Randolph has been out there. The trainer stays out, and Sanchez is going to throw a, a practice pitch here. Mike Herbst, the assistant trainer, is out. Derek Jeter is the only man who's had a hit with a runner in scoring position, including the bunt that he just had. Sanchez throws another one. And he tells Herbst that he's okay. The Yankees in the fourth inning when they got their first two runs. That rally started on a pop up on the first base side. That nobody caught a wind blown pop up that went for a double. Now in this inning the inning started on a walk. Then Damon a little dribbler that went what 40 feet and then a butt by Jeter and they got the bases loaded. Giambi change up strike in its own one. To this Yankee there this is small ball <laughs> <That is>. magnified. <laughs> yeah. They got the base loaded having to hit the ball out of the infield. A Another change up. Change, yeah. Well, we've seen Giambi have a lot of problems with the changeup tonight. And you can see that's a beautiful pitch. Moves down towards him and, and down and in. Shea Stadium is electric. Rudy Giuliani rooting for the Yankees here. And that hard sinker, 96 miles an hour with a lot of movement, too low. And the Giambi did not often chase pitches like that. No. Well, he's, he's has good command of the strike zone. A base hit could tie the game. Three infielders to the right of second for the Mets. Right field coming on. The catch and the throw to second to keep the other runners there. Scoring is Cairo. And it is four to three, a sacrifice fly. Xavier Nady. Made the smart throw there. Yeah, you got to throw, keep the runner at second base. Don't let him move over at third with less than two outs. So that walk to start the inning has turned into a run. And here comes the American League most valuable players. The Mets look like they're going to. Well, they were going to appeal to third base, but the, the umpire over there, Larry Young, said, well, he didn't leave too soon. And the umpires will do that sometime. 
you know, let you know just wasting time. <laughs> Forget about it. All right, here's a Rod. He has walked. But otherwise, 0 for 3. is flying to shallow left, lined out to left, and hit a comeback. And Alo Duca runs out to talk to Sanchez. Sanchez came into this game with an ERA of 1.71. 26 and a third innings pitched. 15 hits allowed. I mean, he has just been sensational. 176 batting average against him. Two men on, only one man out, and here is A-Rod. Too low. Now Sanchez, a veteran of many a Giants and Dodgers battle in his days in L.A., but this weekend his first Yankees Mets experience and look how that wind is just whipping around in here and I think that's part of the problem that some of these Mets are having throwing strikes and we saw that also with Coulter Bean I mean it, it's it's just gets a little windy out there. Damon the possible tie run at second. And he got the attention of Sanchez right there. And Damon is a guy who could steal a bag if you don't keep it a close eye on him. He has one steal already tonight and 11 steals this year. Well, if you're Sanchez, all you have to do is stop him because you don't want to break your concentration from the hitter. Let's see if they can turn to Reyes to Matsui to Delgado. The third double play in the last four innings turned by the Mets. Delgado coming up. Make no mistake, my brothers. They wish to cure us. And I say we are the cure. I'm not going to let that happen. X-Men, The Last Stand. Ready PG-13. Diana. SD for three. Sue. Swin. Lindsay. Lisa. And Simone. Have you seen her? A WNBA doubleheader, Tuesday on ESPN2. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. It's the Mets 4, the Yankees 3, as we go to the last half of the 8th inning now at Shea Stadium. Friends, the Boys and Girls Club of America is the official charity of Major League Baseball. Together, they create a positive place for kids. Check it out at MLB.com. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, Peter Gammon, Sam Ryan, the rubber match of the series, and Alex Rodriguez after hitting into that inning-ending double play, something that doesn't happen in the American League. But he has been removed from the game now as part of a double switch. Miguel Cairo now at third base. Remember, he had already pinched hit for the pitcher, Villon. And they bring in Scott Erickson now. The Yankees only have one other non-pitcher who's able-bodied enough to be used tonight. And Joe Torrey wanted to save that guy. So he's got the double switch. Here is Scott Erickson, veteran sinker baller, longtime starting pitcher. Carlos Delgado, too high, ball one. Erickson had great years with the Orioles in his heyday. He was one of the top pitchers yeah. in the American League, starters. And he was a 20 game winner yeah. when he was very young with the Minnesota Twins before mm -hmm. that. And a changeup in there for a strike. He's had some arm troubles the last several years with the Yankees needing able bodied pitchers. They've had a lot of of their own injury problems. But the Yankees and Mets have had numerous injury problems. Delgado with a big swing and a miss. Well, that was a good fastball, 90 plus mile an hour fastball. Went right after it. Yankees starting out finishes Billy Wagner. He's getting ready in the bullpen. After the, uh, the nightmare yesterday, he'll be given another shot at it. Here tonight, Delgado fouls that one, and that got a piece of the umpire, Tom Hallian. That shook him up a little bit. The Yankees without Hideki Matsui, Gary Sheffield, two of their starting outfielders. Bubba Crosby, a backup outfielder, also is out. 
starting pitcher Carl Pavano is going to have to have surgery. He's out. Jorge Posada not able to play, although not of the disabled list. Sports Center right after the game. Stay tuned for that. Yes, Posada unable to play. Left the game here on Friday night in the second inning. Don Mattingly talking to Posada in the Yankee dugout. Four to three, the Mets lead. The Mets' big hitters are up here. Delgado, or some of them anyway. Delgado and David Wright are coming up, but not Cliff Floyd, who had to leave the game, maybe with an injury. Did he swing? No, says Larry Young, the third base umpire. Really close check swing there by Delgado. You thought he swung? I thought it was very close. <laughs> I can't see the front of the plate well, from here. This, they told. Remember, Sandy Alderson told us a few years back. Yeah. The definition is: Did he attempt did to he strike attempt the ball? Did he attempt to strike the ball? Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? Two and two, the count. He struck that one high in the air, shallow right center. The wind carries it, and Johnny Damon makes the catch. After Melky Cabrera seemed to be nestled right beneath Third him. Baseman. So one away Delgado is gone. The Mets got all of their runs on two bolts of lightning in the fourth inning. But two men on. The Yankees had two nothing. Carlos Delgado into the wind. A three run shot into the Mets bullpen. The next batter was David Wright. Boom. And over the Yankee bullpen off into the darkness. And that made it four to two. The Mets have not scored since. Here's Wright. And the slider, a strike on the outside. The Yankees have pieced together inning after inning since then, Joe, with Mike Myers, Coulter Bean, Ron Vallone, and now Scott Erickson. A, a group of guys that Yankee fans might be saying, who are they? Who, who are those guys? Yeah. But they have shut down the Mets since Aaron Small, the emergency replacement starter for Sean Chacon, left the game in the fifth inning. The Yankees in the ninth inning will greet Billy Wagner with Robinson Cano, Bernie Williams, and Melky Cabrera. Those are the three do up. Up and away. Well, Erickson looks like he's got a pretty little pop on that fastball. Yeah, he does. You know, remember he was a sinker ball pitcher before. It looks like he's throwing a little riding fastball now. One ball, two strikes. Oh, you got a little sink on that one. Yeah, that was a sink. One ball, two strikes. You can see the sink right there. Running down and in and off the plate a little bit. But right. Bounced it foul. And a slider. Shallow center. Look out. Look out, Damon. Look out. Did Damon. No. He caught that no. one. Cano caught it. Cano caught it? Yeah, Cano caught it. <laughs> wow. In the wind, yeah. everything is an adventure tonight in the air. Definitely an adventure. But Cano, watch, he does everything so casual. It just looks easy to him. Watch, see, he just reaches and catches it and avoids <laughs> Damon. Ground ball up the middle. Look at that. I mean, he just reaches and catches it. Now he says, let me avoid well, the collision. That, that could have been a disaster yeah. right there. I mean, because especially if he hits him around his knees. When Johnny Damon was with Oakland. Yeah. In the playoff right. series against Boston. He had a collision with Damian Jackson on a ball similar to that. And that was that yeah. was just horrifying. Well, the one thing you notice there. Is that he's he's down low, meaning Damon. He's learned he wasn't running in with his head up or running up. He got down low, so he wasn't going to have that type of collision anymore. Andy Chavez now. Chavez proved to be a, a very important fill-in for the Mets earlier this year when Carlos Beltran missed a, a long string of games. And Andy Chavez played center field. He played it well, and he hit well. He's not a, a power hitter like. Beltran, but he's a very fast runner. Chavez hitting 292, a homer, and six batted in. Two down, nobody on. Chavez is hitting in place of uh, Cliff Floyd, who left the game, maybe with an injury in the first half of this inning. 
Two and two. Two down. Nobody on. Xavier Nady on deck. He would be next. There is Billy Wagner getting ready for the ninth. Yesterday, he came in in what was, you know, under the rules, a non-save situation because it was a four-run lead when he came in. So he would not charge with a blown save. That's his swing. Strike three. A strong inning for the veteran Scott Erickson. So the Yankee bullpen has come through beautifully. And now Billy Wagner will come on in what is definitely a safe situation. A one run lead. And a chance to atone for the nightmare of yesterday. Cano, Williams, Cabrera. Coming up. Billy Wagner coming in. Number 13. Billy Wagner. The Pittsburgh Steelers are Super Bowl champions. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! Relive all the excitement of their incredible season with Sports Illustrated and this must-have NFL Films DVD, The Pittsburgh Steelers Super Bowl 40 Champions. Plus, this Sports Illustrated commemorative book takes you inside their season and storied history with SI's best writing and photography. Both are free with your paid subscription to SI. Get 56 issues for only $1.59 an issue. Save 60% off the cover price. Use your credit card and get this collectible football honoring the champion Steelers. This exclusive keepsake features the scores from their entire season and includes a display stand and certificate of authenticity. Celebrate the Steelers' unforgettable season with this fantastic Super Bowl package. Go to SIPittsburghoffer.com or call now to get the Super Bowl DVD, the book, and the football, all free from SI. Call 1-800-551-6600 now or go online to SIPittsburghoffer.com. Billy Wagner to Robinson Cano, and that's a strike call to start the ninth inning. Cano goes back to speak briefly with Tom Hallian about that. So Wagner, eight saves, but also three blown saves as a met, not including yesterday. That was not a blown save. Strike two at 99. Well, I'd have to question that speed, but it it looks like it's very fast, but I'd have to question whether that was 99 mile an hour fastball. Looked more like a cut fastball or a slider even. He struck it out. Fastball right there. Well, what a difference a day makes. Yesterday he was all over the place, and today he's throwing strikes. Well, let's take a look. Fastball right on the outside. Another fastball, almost identical location, and a high fastball. See you later. He's. Uh, he brought the heat with him tonight. Yes, he did. Temperature just went up a few degrees. Bernie Williams has been on base four straight times, two doubles and two walks for the veteran who has been a, a great Yankee. He, Jeter, Posada have been here throughout this great run they've had. Mariano Rivera as well. And that is a called strike. And so that's what I was wondering if he was going to throw more sliders. That was a slider. Because what happens is, uh, you know, if you're a little wild, throw something else. There's a slider, big breaking slider for a strike. One and one. Another, Another one. one. Yeah. See, if, if you're erratic as he was yesterday, overthrowing, maybe that's the problem yesterday. Someone should have said to him, let's use your breaking ball since you're wild. That'll keep you from overthrowing. Now he can reach back and just let one go. <laughs> Shea Stadium is rocking a little bit right now. One out. Melky Cabrera on deck. Fastball a little bit low. Let's take a look. There's the target. Man, tough pitch to take there. Two and two to Bernie Williams. Shallow right. Nady. He does not get it. And Bernie is on for the fifth time. Almost that time for Nady. So with one out, the possible tie runners aboard. And the young Melky Cabrera coming up. Here's a look at our passion for excellence presented by Bridgestone Tires. 
Albert Pujols another home run today in Kansas City. Twenty two home runs already. Three this weekend Detroit with the best record in the American League with a big win today over Cincinnati and Barry Bonds yesterday hit number 714 to tie him with Babe Ruth the second on the all time list of home run sluggers and Billy Wagner who's been the epitome of excellence as a closer for many many years trying to get a big one here that's right through the hole Wright was hugging the foul line against the extra base hit possibility and Melky Cabrera gets his first hit of the night and the possible tying run is now in scoring position as Kelly Stinnett will come up yesterday Billy Wagner gave up two hits but he walked three he hit a batter no strikeouts well he only had a third of an inning and it was a, a win for Pedro Martinez who after the game absolved Wagner of any blame saying simply hey that's that stuff happens the slider misses one ball no strikes to Kelly Stinnett. Well you see he went right to the breaking ball there. Stinnett has faced Wagner ten times one hit. Fastball a strike. Let's take a look this fastball kind of tails back from the inside to get a lot of the plate there. One on one another fastball Ooh, just missing on the inside. Two and one. Stinnett is 0 for 3 with a walk in this game. Stinnett the backup to Jorge Posada who is not able to play right now. Back beneath us. Well, when he's, you see a guy get underneath that fastball like that and it comes straight back, that means he was right on it. He was right on that pitch. He just fouled it straight back. All right, so you come back with a breaking ball now? No, I think you, you can't afford to go 3 2 and maybe walk him. You're going to have to go ahead and challenge him again. Two men on, a one run lead for the Mets. Slider right. struck him out. He threw him a breaking ball. The one thing you there's a breaking ball fastball for a strike another fastball up another one up and out of the zone and a great slider I mean if you have confidence that's the pitch to throw John but when you struggle and walk guys as you did yesterday it's kind of hard to reach back and throw a slider to two here's Miguel Cairo he scored the winning run yesterday strike one the Yankees their last chance they've had 12 hits 21 Yankees have reached base three out of the 21 have scored a base hit could tie the game the slider and now it's 0 and 2. Well this is one of those situations where you're 0 and 2. You can afford to try to get him to chase something up and out of the strike zone with your best fastball. Well, he tried to go away with it. Away and low. One and two. Johnny Damon would be next. Bernie Williams, a possible tie run, ready to run at the crack of the bat from second base. And that one was almost a wild pitch. Nice save on a 99 mile an hour fastball by Paul Oduka. Not only is Bernie Williams the possible tying run at second, but Melky Cabrera is the possible go ahead run at first. Four to three Mets. Slider. He got a piece of it. And it's interesting the first base coach Pena is telling Bernie Williams to get a bigger lead at second base. He doesn't want there to be a play on at, at the plate if there's a base hit. He's motioning get wider get a bigger lead. 
Two and two. The slider, and again, bounce foul. But he's staying away from that fastball now. Well, the only problem, you know, with the sliders, if you hang it, and the guy like Cairo is a very good hitter. You know, with two strikes, he's a good hitter. You make a mistake, and he can handle it. But again, he's missed with the fastball when he's tried to overthrow it here. Two and two. Fastball to the right side. Matsui. And the Mets win the ball game. And a good job by Wagner to bounce back. Wagner, a day after one of his worst days, hangs on to give the Mets a one run lead over the Yankees and to give them this series two games out of three in the first round of this year's Subway Series. Well, good job by Matsui. Just that he got down on it and made the pick up and made it easy routine play. But here's a fastball tailing away, and Cairo goes the other way. And Matsui in the perfect position and makes the play. Yeah, Billy Wagner. And that's that's more like it for Billy Wagner. Wasn't easy though. <laughs> the Yankees, they are the Yankees after yeah, all. It was not routine. The Yankees, who had 21 base runners, they went two for 17 in their at bats with runners in scoring position. And that will haunt them as they fly on to Boston and their rendezvous with the Red Sox starting tomorrow night. Tom Glavin wins his 282nd career win. Aaron Small takes the loss. Sports Center coming up next. Now, I'm John Miller for Joe Morgan, Peter Gammons, and Sam Ryan. Thanks for tuning in. Good night from New York. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.